Hey guys, this is Frank Yetter, and you're listening to Submission Radio. Hey, this is Rich Franklin. What's up, everybody? This is Chris Lieben. This is Diego Sanchez. Randy Couture. Alice Overing. Hi, this is Stephen Bonner. This is Don Fry. Hey, I'm Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. TJ Dillashaw. And you're listening to Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. You're listening to Submission Radio. Welcome to Submission Radio. It's January 24th. Dennis Grotter here with Kasper Rosalowski. Another episode of Submission Radio. No UFC this weekend, but an action-packed show for the listeners today, Cass. Of course. UFC event or no UFC events on the weekend, we've still got sexy guests on the show. Uh, and they come in the form of Demetrius Johnson, the flyweight champion, the king of the flyweight division. is coming back to Submission Radio to talk a whole bunch of things. Uh, Uriah Faber He's going to be stopping by at the end of the show very quickly. We don't have a lot of time with the man because he's a very busy man, but he has courteously found a bit of time in his busy schedule to chat to the boys once again. Bona fide submission radio alumni. Of course, we have to get his thoughts on this whole TJ Dillashaw, Dominic Cruz thing, and, you know, potentially fighting Dominic Cruz next. And then a man who is going to be fighting in just a couple of weeks, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, kind of fly under the radar, but he's co-main eventing the freaking event against Johnny Hendricks. He's going to be on the show first time for Submission Radio. So we've got to dig into his past, his history, and really get to know the man. Uh, I'm very excited about these guys. And then we're going to be doing a bit of a roundtable discussion at the end of the episode, aren't we, Dennis? Yeah, that's right. We've got none other than David St. Martin from MMA Fighting joining us for the discussion. Very excited. Uh, David's been on the program last year, and now he's going to join us again this year. It's great to have him returning to the show. And also... You guys are used to my movie reviews, but this day we switch the tables around. Casper is going to be giving us his Revenant review while I give you guys a lowdown on George Costanza's bar in Melbourne, Australia. Is it any good? Does it live up to the Seinfeld hype that fans have been hearing about? You'll find out at the end of the show. Yeah, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Submission AUS on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Submission Radio AUS. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of content. If you haven't subscribed, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. It's a no-brainer. Uh, we got the UFC 197 press conference with Conor McGregor, Rafael Dos Anjos, Holly Holm, Misha Tay. We've got the stare downs. We've got the full press conference. We're going to be putting up a bit of a compilation of some of the best moments from that. We've got Conor McGregor's prediction. We've got technique of the week, a whole bunch of stuff. And on that topic of the press conference, actually, that's actually going to be one of the topics that we're going to be talking about with David St. Martin, that press conference, how Conor McGregor handled himself, how RDA handled himself. I think that's one of the biggest questions. We're also going to be talking about rematches. If there's too many of them, we're going to be talking about uh, Tony Ferguson potentially getting screwed over with his latest matchup. So there is a lot to talk about this episode and a lot of people to talk to. Without further ado, we're going to be getting right into it. Uh, Dennis, I believe we have our first guest right on the line. Our next guest is arguably the number one pound-for-pound fighter in the world, the UFC flyweight champion. He has gone unbeaten since 2011. It's a pleasure to welcome back Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson to Submission Radio. Demetrius, welcome to the program. Hey, man. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. It's always great having you on the show. Now, uh, every time you come on the program, you love talking gaming. We've seen you've been kicking Rampage Jackson's uh, his ass on, ramp- on Rainbow Six Siege. Is that correct? Yes, yes. You know, unfortunately, we just lost last night to Team Rampage, so the score is 1-1, and we're going to have the rubber match here pretty soon on uh, on Twitch. But uh, yes, that's where it's going right now. Let's talk about this matchup for a second. I mean, when you look at Team Rampage, what are some of the weaknesses that you can talk about? What are some of the advantages that Team Johnson has over him? And how big is you the know- team? Well, you know, the team is, uh, you know, the team is uh, the whole Mighty Squad. You know, we, we run as a full <laughs> operated system on Twitch. And uh, one of the things I want to say about the Mighty Squad is that we are very well versatile in our gameplay. You know, they typically only play Rainbow Six Siege to where I, we play everything. We're good at Destiny. We're good at uh, Call of Duty Black Ops 3. Um, you know, I also play uh, Bloodborne, Dark Souls games. So he typically sticks to first-person shooters. He... He, he's in love with Rainbow Six Siege. So the very first time we played him and we beat him, he was very upset about it. <laughs> and the second time, he, he practiced all week, and I even practiced not one bit. And then, uh, you know, I wasn't even the weakest link on my team because I was putting in work as well. Uh, but, yes, that, those are the advantages I'll say. We were very well versatile in our uh, squad. I feel like there's parallels, just like yourself, very well-rounded team, uh, good in all areas. This thing's obviously far too big for pay-per-view. I'm just curious, people can watch it on Twitch. Anywhere specific, anything specific they have to type in to watch this uh, this main event, so to speak? Well, yes. Um, if they want to just watch me or him on Twitch in general, you know, my Twi- Twitch channel is uh, MightyMouseUFC125, 
and his his rampage is human. Um, and obviously, you have to go www twitch.tv slash then my handle then either rampage channel depending on what they want to watch or if they just uh, follow me on twitter i always post when i'm going live on uh twitch as well mm, I, I know he's famous for doing his prank calls on twitch does this mean there's going to be some rampage jackson dimitri smarty mouse johnson combined prank calls in the future via twitch <laughs> You know, I don't think so. Uh, I try to, you know, I try to be different from everybody else on Twitch. You know, to where I like to interact a lot with my chat. Also, uh, play different games. On Thursday, we do Throwback Thursday, and currently, right now, we're playing Zelda, Zelda Ocarina of Time mm, uh, that wow. was chosen by uh, the Mighty Squad members, the subscribers. So, uh, I'll be different. But you know, if I'm ever hanging out with Rampage and you know I'm at his house or he's at my house, which will probably never happen, then maybe if he wants to prank call somebody, I'll jump in with him. Yeah, double, double team prank calls. That's where it's at these days. What other games have you been playing, Demetrius? And what are your thoughts on Star Wars Battlefront? Because that's something that we've been playing a bit recently. Yeah, uh, I've been playing a little bit of everything. You know, like I said, I just finished Bloodborne, uh, my first playthrough on a PS4, and working currently on nothing. Um, I just got my Hunter and Destiny up to level 40, trying to get him some, her some gear. It's mm-hmm. actually a, a version of Destiny, my wife, of her in the future. <laughs> and uh, I played Star Wars Battlefront. The game is, it's, eh, I'm not going to lie, it's okay. It, it's not the best game out there. Um, I think it's very choppy, especially like the games um, out there, first person shooters like Call of Duty Black Ops 3, um, Destiny, and Rainbow Six Siege. I think that's probably at the very low of the pay scale. Not pay scale, but at the the scale for my taste. Mm-hmm. Uh, but other than that, it's a great game. You know, I'm, cool. I'm glad they made uh, Star Wars into the game into you know first person shooter but they've made um amazing star wars games in the past so it's kind of hard to for me to say this one lives up to the best star wars game they made mm, yeah it's one of those things and I, you're a big star wars fan yourself was a part of your little because we did expect a lot from this game me and casper do play it but when it came out there was so much hype on all the big websites like ign you sort of expect it to be really really good were you a little bit disappointed when you sort of first played through it did you have higher expectations for the game uh, for Star Wars Battlefront, you, well, you know, I, I'm typically not a person who plays through the campaign unless it interests me, and I kind of know what Star Wars is about. I mean, it, it's a movie, so I was more intrigued by the multiplayer. But when I played a couple matches, I was just like, eh, it, I, it just didn't, you know, hit me the right way, you know, especially with Halo 5 coming out. Uh, you know, like I can say Call of Duty, Rainbow Six, those games run so much smoother, and I, I just didn't like it. I felt like Star Wars belonged in the big screens and a big multi mass online play or done a little bit better, you know, just make it Call of Duty style, just put the skins on, uh, put skins over Call of Duty of uh, Star Wars, but mm. I felt they didn't do that. Well, before we get done talking about games, obviously we've got to mention EA UFC. Are you pretty excited about, obviously, the the sequel coming out, EA UFC 2? We know you've got the beard in the game. Excited about this? Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm excited to see what difference that they did um, from its predecessors, you know, the last UFC EA game they came out with last year. Mm-hmm. Um, also, to see the graphics on a new gen console on PS4. I'm not sure if it was on PS3 last year. I, it wasn't just next so. gen. It was this, so it was next gen as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll be curious to see what they do with that, and just see how many you know people that have on. And they said the roster is going to be huge. Mike Tyson's on there, so that's mm. going to be sweet. And I'm pretty sure all my fans on Twitch are ready to beat me up on that game because <laughs> I'm I am more of a Street Fighter guy. Uh, but I'm gonna get my uh, I'm gonna put some skills in the game and see how good I can get. Yeah, I feel like they need to let Mike Tyson fight in the flyweight division because I'd love to play Mighty Mouse versus Mike Tyson. But you know, getting into the world of MMA, we men- mentioned in the intro that you've been undefeated since 2011. The man who beat you was Dominic Cruz, who did win his title back last week. And just want to know, what did you think of his fight? And did you think the right man got his hand raised? Uh, it was a great fight between Dominic Cruz and Tia Dosha. I mean, it was a razor thing, close fight. Um, I felt, you know, watching the fight at the heat of the moment uh, with Dom and TJ fighting, I, I felt that Dom w- did enough to win the fight. Uh, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, he got hit with the harder shots and he backed up Brandon Line. I'm like, well, guys, you have, you have okay, it's mixed martial arts. You know, it's there's no such thing as stalling. Like a guy can hit you with one, two punches and run away and wait till you overextend and hit you again. You know, it, it, it's fighting. Um, but like I said, in the heat of the moment, as me watching the fight, I felt Dominic Cruz won the fight. In order for me to, you know, go back and sit down as a judge 
and, and score the, the score the fight in my book, then it, it, it could be totally different. But I think for the most part, uh, it would come out the same way that I felt Dom because he had the wrestling advantage as well. Um, he actually went for the finish, trying to go for the dark choke. Mm. Um, so right there, he, he's trying to finish the fight instead of just trying to, you know, when when the opportunity pre- presented himself to latch on that submission, he did. But TJ got out, and then TJ jumped on top, and then they were wrestling, and they, and they separated. So. Word on the street is, which is where we get all the intel from, uh, Demetrius, is that you want to fight Dominic Cruz next. What is it that makes you want to go up in weight and, and fight Cruz, especially when you know he's just had this very impressive return and appears to be as good as, as he's ever been? And when you watch that fight at home, did you sort of look at it and think, man, I can beat this guy? Is it something that went through your head and is that one of the reasons why you want the fight next? Uh, you know, one of the reasons why, why we were, you know, tempting that, you know, we've always wanted to fight uh, Dominic Cruz again, not, not because there's some bad blood or I lost to him, a little bit of that I lost to him, but at the same time, it's just, you know, he, he's, he, he was the un, uncrowned champ, you know, he never lost as a champion, they, you know, they stripped him of his belt from his injury, and I felt that me in the first fight we had, it was a rough fight for me, but I felt like I gave him his best fight to date, just trying to push him, you know, other than TJ, TJ did an amazing job as well, um, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's something that back burner, you know, everybody's been talking about super fights, you got RDA taking on Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor is trying to, you know, make history, getting two belts. And I think, you know, for me and my team, uh, Matt Hume and AMC, we want to, we would love to try to become, you know, a two weight world champion. But at the same time, the money's got to be right. It's got to be the stars that got to align. Um, first things first is I got to make sure I can keep my belt and break Anderson Silva's title defenses. Mm. And then after that, when I've done that, you know, I have more marketing power and marketability marketability and everybody's loving me then i'm like you know i beat Anderson silver's record now it's time to go beat conor mcgregor's record he didn't he didn't become you know a two-weight champion he lost rda i'm gonna see if i can do it by dominic cruz and by any means it will not be an easy fight dominic cruz is an absolute absolute beast you just mentioned something about conor mcgregor losing to rda are you looking into the future marty mouse no 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 <laughs> i don't I, yeah you see I, I don't think it's gonna be a tough fight for both those guys. Um, the biggest thing, you know, when I look into that fight is that Conor McGregor is not a small dude at 155. He's mm-hmm. almost bigger than uh, RDA just by a little bit, like reach, uh, range. You know, one might be fatter than another one, like as weight wise, but I think that's gonna come into play. And at the end of the day, you know, um, we're gonna have to see where the fight goes. You know, if if RDA overextends and gets too, you know, wild with the shots. Connor will pick his shots, and, and you know it, it's no secret. Connor McGregor has heavy hands. He knows the right shot. He knows the soft spot of the face, and if he lands there, then it'll be an easy night, easy check for Connor McGregor to go back home and cash it, and buy himself some nice toys, some more Lambo that spit fire. But <laughs> if if uh, RDA can get in there, um, wrestle with Connor, push Connor, you know, break Connor mentally, which I don't see that happening. Then I can think I can see the fight going to RDA. So that's you know my breakdown of that fight. How either two one let's go, or you know who knows they they might push. Connor might get pushed, and he you know rises to the occasion, and you know he he shows all this sick shit he knows how to do, and then he wins the fight. So I mean it's gonna be a tough fight for both those guys. For sure. Well, going back to you and obviously Dominic Cruz, I mean, after his win, Cruz said, I think that I could put it on DJ2 again, just like I did last time. You mentioned your respect for him and his skills. We kn- and we know you'd, you'd expect him to say that, given his confidence. But considering that since that fight, you've gone on to create your own legacy as a champion and been called the pound for pound number one fighter in the world, not to mention in, you know, all your improvements. Did those comments motivate you at all that he thought he could beat you, you know, just as he did last time? No, you know, I don't need any motivation. I don't need... Uh, you know, any, uh, an opponent say, oh, I can beat you to motivate me. You know, when I get the contract and it's in my lap and I'm like, okay, let's sign on the dot. Let's make this happen. That's all the motivation I need. You know, I have a family um, and I got to, you know, I provide for them. And, you know, as a competitor, I'm a very competitive person and I want to leave, you know, a pretty sweet legacy behind me. So no motivation. Anybody can talk trash about me. People in the past half before, before we fought and it has never changed, you know, my my way I go about training. I just go in there with a clear mind that I'm going to go out and beat this person, and that's it. Mm. Well, if you guys did fight again, what would be different if, if you guys got matched up opposed to back then when you lost to him in 2011? The biggest thing is that I felt his footwork before. I felt his range before. I mm-hmm. know I know his recipe 
to beat me. And it's no secret. He's a bigger dude than me. He, he has a longer range. Um, his footwork is good. And the hardest thing is when you, when you saw the first, the fight between TJ and Dom, when TJ would chase Dom, Tom, like you guys don't realize to me, when somebody's five, I think Dom's five, eight or five, nine, I'm not sure. But when somebody's five, nine and I'm five, three, and if he stands up tall and backs up, I can't get to his head. So it, it's a hard thing. Dom's a hard person to fight because he's tall and he's long and he uses a lot of footwork. So half the time, you know, when you saw TJ and him fighting, TJ kept throwing that high kick. And a high kick would land, but by the time it gets up to Dominic Cruz's neck, it's lost all its juice because Dom is backing up, pulling away, and he's also a taller fighter. So it's a tough fight. But like I said, the difference would be that I've been in there before. I typically do better in my rematches, but I always have to worry about that Dom is a bigger dude. He, he's a... Uh, He's longer, and he, he can wrestle. And like I said, when I mean he's a bigger dude, I woke up the other day weighing 139 and a half, and I was eating whatever I want. So mm. that just shows you that it's only four-pound cut for me to where he's probably walking around 155, 160 maybe. Mm. Huge, yeah, the, the, when you put it like that, there's a huge size difference. The other thing we notice about Dominic Cruz, and it's not really new, he's always been a very, very confident guy, confident in what he says, but against TJ Dillashaw, there was, seemed to be a lot more sort of verbal warfare. And he, he's been a you know big trash talker in the past. And some guys, they're not fans of, of the way he carries himself, and some guys, it seems like it gets under their skin. What are, you, what are your thoughts about that and you know the way he sort of carries himself? I like the way Dominic Cruz carries himself. You have to carry yourself like that, especially what that man's gone through. Three ACL surgeries, a groin tear. I mean, why why wouldn't you carry yourself like your God? Mm. Actually, you say, and, and especially when he sits back and he's been able to analyze every fighter that's gone through the UFC roster within the last, what, two or three years, you kind of gain uh, self-respect for your, your, your footwork, which you bring to the octagon. And it, it was funny. Somebody did a, a video of the announcement of right before TJ and uh, Dominic Cruz about the fight. And you see they announce Dominic Cruz first. And each time they announce Dominic Cruz first, he does his footwork. He shows his footwork, his fancy footwork. He's always done that ever since, you know, when he first got in the UFC or even a WC, then they turn the camera on to TJ Dillashaw and he's doing the exact same type of footwork that Dominic Cruz has done. And you see that all the stuff that Dominic Cruz has been talking about, you know, TJ Dillashaw is a wannabe. He's done this and that and that. You kind of see like he kind of took a little bit of his style, which is totally fine. Why not take somebody's style who uses it very well to not get hit? I mean, why not? I mean, yes, you come want to be, but like, yeah, if I was to be a professional basketball player, I want to be like fucking Michael Jordan. So I'm going to copy every mm. single thing that Michael mm. Jordan is do doing. So for me, if I was a smart guy, I would have, you know, twisted that, twisted Dominic Cruz's words. Like, dude, you're just a want to be. I was like, of course I want to be a want to be. You know, I'm a better want to be because I, my footwork is way better than yours. And why wouldn't I steal your footwork? So mm. that's how I saw it. If it was going to war awards, if I was, you know, my, my footwork's totally different between TJ and uh, Dominic Cruz's. Mm. Mm. If you had to choose what's next between fighting Cejudo or having the super fight, I mean, you mentioned that you want to cement your legacy in the flyweight division, but what would you prefer next if you had both contracts on the table and it was your choice between the two? Well, the first of all, uh, ooh, see, now you said two contracts on the table. Well, first, if it was two contracts on the table, I will look to the to, to the money page to see which uh, number is bigger. Well, we know I'll... which one's bigger. It's, you know <laughs> which one's bigger. <laughs> well, well, you know, well, you know my price is for the Super Fight. It's $2 million. So if I flip over to the Dominic Cruz page and I see that $2 million, that seven figure, I'm going to sign that fucking contract. And a dumbass would, uh, an idiot would be the only person that signed a contract. But... You know, like I said, if the contract's that and it's a $2 million, absolutely, I'll go for that super fight. Um, I should, I'll put my kids through college and I would never have to fight again. I'll be smart with that money. Yeah. But um, at, <laughs> my wife goes, no, you wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> Call that by the wife. Uh, that's not the reality right now. Um, obviously, whatever fights next to me for the flyweight division, that's what's going to be next. So that's that's the price tag two million dollars, and we, we've we've spoken about it on the show before as well. Um, it, it, some people are saying that's one of the reasons why this fight may not happen in the future. Who knows if the UFC would would sort of pony up the cash if they offer you, you know, one point nine 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 nine. Would you still be taking the fight? I mean, obviously you would for that amount, but if they say, look, we'll give you one million, we'll give we'll give you half a million, would that still be enticing enough, or would you say, listen, Ugh. I'm worth more? 
Yeah, I, I feel I'm worth more. I mean, I feel that if the UFC can net grow six hundred million dollars, they can they can spare two million dollars of that. They won't even fucking notice it. It's gone. So that that's my case, and I, I value myself at a high level, and I think everybody should. And I think with all these other fighters, you know, uh, finding out the end of their contracts and seeing what they're worth, I think it's good. At the end of the day, it's about can you pay your bills? You know, we are all athletes, and our window of opportunity to make as much money as possible is a short window. So. For me to go up to a different weight class and take on the champion, uh, even and I, like I said, guys, I, I I don't I don't need to go to fight. I don't need to go fight Dominic Cruz. I don't need to go fight for the one thirty pound belt. I don't I don't need to. There's nothing in my life that says, oh, you know, you gotta go do it. Right now, I'm focused on breaking the top defenses, putting enough money away for me after I'm done fighting in mixed martial arts. I can have a smooth transition into my next career and have enough money. To where I don't have to look back like, man, I should have done this and this with my money, mm. and I, I mm. want to make sure I'm well taken care of, and that's how it should be for Connor and for Connor taking on Aldo. That was the biggest fight in his life. I'm pretty sure he made a hefty penny, which he should, and he brought in all the numbers. Totally cool. And when he fights RDA, he should make another hefty penny. If he's smart with his money, don't buy all, don't buy all those fucking toys. <laughs> Invest that money, buy a house, pay that off, and then he can do whatever he wants. And so that's where my mindset is. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm gonna, my my mindset is to take care of my family, and the kids, and make sure I got enough money in, in, in investments. I'm good to go. Mm, well, you sort of covered this next question, but you, you just mentioned it. I mean, Conor McGregor talking about what he's worth and getting a bigger slice of the pie. You mentioned your thoughts on that, but where do you really stand? Are you after more than you're getting? And do you feel like we're in the age where fighters are rising and demanding what they think they deserve, especially more than in past years? Yeah, I think we're at that age now where fighters are asking more, uh, asking what they believe they are worth. You know, you guys, you got a guy like, Ajama Sterling, per- perfect example. You know, mm. Ajama Sterling, he's undefeated as a, a bantamweight, and his last fight he made twenty four thousand dollars. Took on a, a tough uh, Brazilian, ended up finishing him. And then you have a guy like Sage Norca, and I, I don't dislike any of these guys. I'm just pointing out facts and telling mm. the truth. Right. You had a guy like Sage Norca who made eighty G's, and it was his what second or third fight in the UFC. I never even heard of Sage Norca until he jumped in the UFC. So the UFC made. Sage Northcutt, the man he is. That's why he's so popular because they made him that popular. Like the UFC makes stars. You know, obviously the UFC markets people behind them, but it's up to the athlete to go out there and perform and people to like you. And I feel that Azuma Sterling hit it on a couple good points. Like he was like, dude, what's the difference between me and Sage Northcutt? Like, what's the difference? Why is he getting 80 grand and I'm getting $24,000? I'm undefeated. And and I think it's right for the UFC. He goes, dude, this is why you're getting, this is why Sage is getting 80 grand, and this is why you're getting $24,000. And just be upfront about it. I mean, a lot of people are scared to be upfront about it, but at the end of the day, when he calls out the numbers, I think he's uh, entitled, or he's not entitled, but I think it's right that somebody tells him why he's not making as much as Sage Northcutt because the guy's undefeated. And he's a bantamweight, where bantamweights need high prospects fighter to fight. The champion Dom Cruz because at mm. the end of the day nobody's want, nobody does want to see the triangle of TJ Dom Uriah Faber and those guys go back and forth at three. We need to get other guys you know like Thomas Almeida, Azuma Sterling, guys who are undefeated, guys who can push the pace, guys mm. who bring a different style to make a different story. But you know you that's why you're having the fighters coming out saying that this is what they're worth and they're taking a stand, and whatnot, and, and, and it's good. Um, but let's hope they get those guys up there and I'm sure they will get themselves up there. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's all my piece for that. Mm. It's what's, what's really interesting to me. And I think a lot of the listeners, Demetrius, is that you're the first ever flyweight champion. You've been champion for quite a long time and you've been fighting quite regularly, but you mentioned the fact that you still feel like you, you need to make more money before you retire and have enough money for your family. I mean, most people watching the sport would think a champion of that caliber and as successful as yourself would have a quite a substantial amount of money saved up. Is it is it sort of crazy, I suppose, to you that you've been that dominant in the division, you've been champion for such a long time, but you're still in this position where you have to go out there and fight to make sure your family's secure? Uh, no, no, not at all. Um, I, I still think if... Uh... You, you look at a guy like John Jones, who was so dominant in the UFC, mm-hmm. and uh, he's still 
That's a very tricky question because at the end of the day, it all depends on how much money the person's made, how smart they were with their money, did they take any risks and uh, invest in it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, if I was to stop fighting today, would my family be okay? Well, yeah, they would be fine because I'll go get another job and not sit on my ass and try to, you know, milk, you know, every check I got from the UFC down the dry. But I, I mean, I'm going to get to that point now where it's like, holy shit, Demi Johnson, you just won this fight. You know, you, you defending your belt 12 times. Here's a check for $3 million. Thank you so much, Dana White. Thank you, Lorenzo Petita. Thank you, Sean Shelby Joseph. All you guys truly appreciate every single one of you guys. I'm going to, you know, pay my taxes, put, you know, a million dollars in investments and put the rest in the bank and et cetera. You know what I mean? That That's where it's like, boom, you're taken care of. <laughs> mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um, to where I... I haven't got to that 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 structure. I haven't got to that that pedestal yet. That's what I'm I'm working towards. That's what I mean by I want that check where it has seven figures. And you know maybe I never meet that you know that that number because I don't you know have you know the whole fucking island. Uh, I don't have Washington behind my back or the whole North America behind my back like you know other fighters do. But mm. that's my goal and that's working towards. And that's all I can that's all I can say is if I keep on fighting and winning the fights that I doing and keep being dominant hopefully one day you know i can be like gsp like yeah man when i fought each time i fought in the ufc i made a five million dollars mm-hmm. and you know gsp gsp said that before in his past but you know grant gsp had all of canada behind him your your last fight was in september demetrius just wondering when are you hoping to be back in the octagon in 2016 <clears throat> obviously um april or april, march april hope for then you know they, they're they're starting to book out the fights um that far you know they got may 7th that's uh vitor and anderson so hopefully around that range you know last year i fought september 27th um i believe against chris carriasso um not 2000 2014 i fought chris carriasso then i fought in 2015 i fought kyoji in april mm. so hopefully around that same time frame Mm. Well, I mean, it's pretty much a given for most fans that they believe that Cejudo should be your next opponent. So let's just talk about that matchup really quickly. What do you think your biggest advantages over him would be? And would his wrestling be a concern at all to you? Uh, well, I would say my biggest advantage that would be over him is that I fought uh, uh, high-caliber, grady high-caliber uh, athletes um, in mixed martial arts. Uh, you know, I fought Joseph twice, Dawson twice, uh, Ali Bagotinov, a world Sambo champion. I don't know how many times he was a world Sambo champion. Um, I mm. fought uh, John Moraga. I mean, the list just goes on. Kyojo Horiguchi, he's only lost once in mixed martial arts, and he's fought all around the world. He was a Shuto champion. So I fought other tough opponents in mixed martial arts where I feel he hasn't fought the guys that I fought. You know, like Dominic Cruz says, you know, me as a fighter, I've made him to where he is. TJ's added to that list. You're right, favorites added to the list and so forth. I feel the same way. I feel the guys I beat in the past and gone into going into this fight. I've been in five round wars where I've got things didn't go my way the first two rounds, and I was able to make adjustments and and, and beat the beat the guy. So that's the biggest advantage I see going into this fight. Um, and I would say uh, is his wrestling in a concern. I, I would say you have to respect his wrestling. He's an Olympic gold medalist in. Uh, wrestling and if for me to not respect it would make me stupid and uh, naive so don't um but if that's the fight that's gonna be made then we will get after it and hope for the best now demetrius you've been very gracious with your time we appreciate it and we'll let you go in just a moment before we do we're going to get through the submission radio tap out round which is a few fun questions uh and you basically answer with the first thing that comes to mind much like word association so you're ready Let's do it. All right, so now that we're kicking off 2016, we have to ask what the official Demetrius Johnson movie of 2015 is. I will accept the start of 2016 as well. Uh, Mad Max, Road Fury. Oh, wow. Okay, well, we saw you've been hitting the slopes. We just have to know, is DJ a skier or a snowboarder? Snowboarder. Now, good man. When uh, Demetrius Johnson plays Age of Empires 2, does he use the cheats to have the convertible car with the, with the little rockets? First of all, I didn't know you can have a fucking cheat code to get a convertible in the Age of Empire. So <laughs> uh, that would be yes, I guess now. It's a learning experience for both of us every time you come on the program. Now, <laughs> Batman versus Superman. Should our expectations be low? Well, my expe- my expectations is high. So the movie better do good or else they're going to fall behind the scene, like uh, behind Marvel. Mm. Star Wars Force Awakens. Rating out of five, Demetrius. Give it to us. I give it a four, four and a half. Oh, smart man. That's the rating I gave it. So bright minds think alike. Now, when playing Star Wars Battlefront, which character do you prefer to play as in the heroes versus villains mode? 
You know, honestly, fucking Han Solo. Because yes. the lights the lightsaber action is horrible in that game. Ah, we've been playing as Luke Skywalker, getting pretty good, but Han Solo's got that uh, rapid fire. Yeah, Han's our favorite as well. Now, if you one of the last questions. If you had to pick UFC fighters to play in Dragon Ball Z movie, who would be Goku, Piccolo, Frieza, and Krillin? Ooh. Uh, well, my black ass would be Krillin. <laughs> but he dies uh, all the time. That, that can't be. That's okay. That's okay. This will be changing. We'll change it different. All right. Uh, I'll be Krillin. And who would be Goku? You know what? I feel Carlos Conrad could be Goku. He seems like a good man with a good soul. Hmm. He could be Goku. And who else? Piccolo? Mm -hmm. Ah, Piccolo. It has to be someone who's bald. I'll give Piccolo to Jacare. Yeah, yes. Jacare. Yes. And then, and then who else do I have to have? Frieza. Frieza. Ooh, Frieza. Who's... Mm. <laughs> Damn it. You know what? I... I, I, I I would say I'll give it to Connor. Connor's not an evil guy. I'll give Connor Mr. Satan because he talks a lot. Yeah. Um, but he can back it up. But Mr. Satan's never fighting my so nobody knows. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll be like okay. um, For Frieza, who's the bad guy that everybody does not like? Ooh, Frieza would be Nate Diaz. Nate Diaz or Nick Diaz? Yeah. <laughs> that is what he's dressed expectations, that list. Connor was, Connor was dressed a bit like him at the recent press conference, so I think yeah, that, that exactly. does work. Now, <laughs> if you collected all of the Dragon Balls, what would your wish be? Oh, my wish be? Oh, to give me and my wife eternal, uh, my family eternal life. Oh, there you go. You're sounding like a Goku there, uh, Demetrius. Now, finally, the last question will let you go. What's the Demetrius Johnson biggest goal for 2016? Stay healthy. Stay healthy. Stay healthy. Uh, that's the biggest goal. Because as, as long as I'm healthy, then I can see my title defense. Uh, defense is going uh, very well this this year. At the end of the day, it's, it's you know my skill set is there. I'm still learning. I'm with the best team in the world, the best coach. You know, coach still beats my butt and trains with me. As long as I keep this body together, then we're good to go. Well, there you guys go. You can catch him on Twitch and also follow him on Twitter at Mighty Mouse UFC. Demetrius, always a pleasure having you on the program. We look forward to see what's next for you in 2016. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. What's up, everybody? This is Chris Lieben, and you're listening to Submission Radio. They're fucking rad. Our next guest is making his first appearance on Submission Radio, one of the most exciting strikers in the welterweight division. He's known for his devastating kicks, which has led him to an impressive 20-0 record in kickboxing. Now in MMA, he has a pivotal fight with Johnny Hendricks at UFC 196. Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, welcome to Submission Radio. Hey, man. Thanks for having me on, guys. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's absolutely our pleasure to have you on the show, Stephen. Now, and welcome to the program. Before we get into it, we have to ask you about your baby, of course, we're talking about your super. How's she coming along? Oh my goodness, that is that is definitely my number one right now. Um, she's doing great, man. You know, I've got uh, some stuff on the way to make it a little bit faster. She's a single turbo, you know, about five hundred and thirty to the wheels. Got some cams and sixteen hundred cc injectors coming, and uh, going to turn the boost up. Nice. Wow, it sounds like you'll be speeding around. Now, we want to jump back in time to UFC 143 in 2012. You, of course, you made your UFC debut and had a highlight reel finish. People are saying that this was saying that you were the next big thing in the division. I just want to ask you, when you look back at that moment, do you think your skills were ready to go up against the best guys in the division back then? Well, you know what? Um... You know, I actually actually started MMA actually in 2010. Had my had my first fight. You know, I was already pro in kickboxing, so I couldn't go back amateur. Um, at the time, you know, George St. Pierre, Rashad Evans, Nate Marquardt, these guys kind of inspired me to actually switch over from kickboxing to MMA. And uh, in my first fight, I remember um, just not in the UFC, just first fight period. I didn't have I had very little jujitsu, very little wrestling. And you know mm -hmm. what? To be honest with you, I was just kind of winging it. You know, relying on my striking. Slowly, I got a, a wrestling coach, and I, of course, my brother-in-law Carlos Machado started working with me more. My ground game got a little bit better, and I was five and zero uh, as a pro then. And then, next thing you know, the UFC calls and say, "Hey, man, we want you on this on this card." So I was very nervous at the time because I felt that I wasn't ready, you mm. know, to move to the UFC. But my dad was like, "Hey, man, um, you know, my dad's my main coach. Um, he was like, "Hey, man, this is once in a lifetime opportunity. You don't want to look back." And say you wish you 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 actually took the fight, because um, if you say no, they probably will never ask you again. Mm. And thank goodness I did take it. Uh, I really worked hard on my wrestling and my jujitsu at the time. There was still a little bit of uh, doubt, you know. But I went out there and I did it anyway. Had ended up having a first round, uh, you know, KO. And then I remember two days after that fight, I got a call back and they said, "Hey, we want you ready for Atlanta in a or early April." And I was thinking, you know, 
it's kind of soon. Um, and, uh, but we were excited about the, you know, the, the knockout and got the bonus that night. So we're like, heck yeah. And then they were like, well, you're fighting Matt Brown. I was like, Oh my goodness. You know, I was like, this guy's, you know, he's a monster. He's been in the game for a long time, Mm. but you know what? We took it anyway and we learned a lot from it. Well, yeah, exactly. That Matt Brown fight, you know, it showed some gaps in your skills in in, in that fight. Obviously, how difficult was it for you to catch up in the grappling areas of your game? And was that fight with him the real eye opener for you? Oh, yeah, definitely, man. We learned a lot, a lot uh, from that fight, uh, you know, with the weight cut. I was walking around at the time about 210 pounds and trying to cut the 170 just killed me. Yeah. And, um, you know, but no excuses, man. You know, I went out there and I gave it all I got. I I told myself this guy's not going to knock me out. He's not going to submit me because I remember in the first round I was I was done. I had I had zero legs. I didn't have my legs. I couldn't move. I remember looking over at my dad and him just looking it's like, what are you doing? You know, I was like, I can't move. Mm. But uh, I look back at it now and I, I thought I did a lot better than than, uh, you know, what I was thinking I was doing at the time. Um you know, because I only watched it one time after the fight, and here recently I went back watched it again. I was like, man, I'm I'm such a different fighter now, and and more confident in my ground than ever. Mm. Well, Chris Weidman, who you've trained with, went on record and said Stephen Thompson is a serious problem for the welterweight division. What did you think when you saw those comments from Weidman? Wow, I I was literally thinking, wow, man, this is coming from the champion. Mm. I was like, you know, it's it's such an honor, and he's such a good friend. You know, I was I. He asked me to come up for his first fight against Anderson Silva. Uh, he ended up, of course, knocking him, you know, knocking him out. And he asked, he asked me to come back for the second one. And then uh, Leo Tomachita, then Vitor Belford. And, you know, we slowly started to grow a, a really, really strong relationship. And, you know, he's, he's a family friend now and a good bud. And he actually comes and helps me with my training camps. And, and tremendously, like, to be honest, my ground game and my wrestling, just my wrestling defense has, has uh, you know, jumped leaps and bounds just, just from working with him. Well, it's interesting. You mentioned Weidman, the former middleweight champion. You, of course, also trained with George St. Pierre, the former welterweight champion. Who did you learn the most from in terms of using your grappling, you know, proficiently in an MMA environment? Wow. Oh, you know what? I can't. I can't really say. I mean, they're both uh, great wrestlers, um, and they use their striking very well to get the fight where they want to be, and that's the ground to get those takedowns. I learned uh, a lot with, um, you know, George St. Pierre, cause at the time I was strictly kickboxing. Mm. You know, they wanted me to come in and be a good sparring partner, a good striker for him. Cause he was stri- He was fighting guys like Carlos Condit, uh, Tiago Alves. Um, you know, I helped him out with this fight with John Fitch. So I was up there a lot training at TriStar, helping George out. And of course, you know, I had to change my whole striking, uh, you know, style for the wrestlers. And I learned that from him and from Chris, it's just the grind that he puts himself through, just the mental uh, anguish he puts himself through in the gym. Um, nothing phases him. It doesn't matter how hard his workout is. If his body's aching, it doesn't matter. He goes out there. Of course, he trains smart, but he doesn't let any of that. A lot of fight. I see a lot of guys make excuses because, oh, you know, I'm feeling a little sore. Oh, you know, you know what? Uh, I'm, my body's feeling kind of tired, and I'm going to take a break. Not with this guy. You know, he's always doing something. He's always training. Uh, even when he's tired, he's always doing something. It may not be really uh, strenuous on his body, but he's he's preparing for his fight. If, if it's physically, mentally, emotionally, he's getting ready for it. And that's what I learned from him. Mm. Well, I was mentioning GSP before. The funny thing is many people think that Hendricks beat GSP in his last fight in the UFC. And now here you are, <laughs> almost avenging George in many ways. Have you had a chance to speak to him about Hendricks? And if so, what has he told you? Yeah, you know, we try to get him actually come down here for for our camp. Uh, that couldn't happen. He has a few teammates up in Montreal. He's getting ready for it. They're also fighting in February, so he wasn't able to make it. But my pops got to you know pick his brain a little bit and and um, you know see what we needed to work on if we were out there, if we were you know going to face Johnny Hendricks. Um, at the time, you know, I wasn't really sure if I was going to fight him or not. I didn't find out till I think uh, it was Thanksgiving. I was actually up in New York training with Chris at the time, mm. and. Um, you know, so we weren't really sure if it was going to happen, if it if it if it wasn't going to happen. So, but we still called him up, picked his brain a little bit, and he gave us some some pointers. And uh, of course, we're we're back here in South Carolina now. We're working on him. And just quickly, we got to ask, you know, you knowing George, how do you think he'd fare against the current champion Robbie Lawler in a sort of fantasy scenario? Who, who, how would that fight play out? I would say George, obviously. I mean, he he's he's I think he's more ex, he's more experienced. Uh, I think he's got really good takedowns. He's just a, a strategist, man. Um, you know, he comes in the fight already won. He, he goes, he really goes, uh, into the camp. 
uh, into the gym and studies his opponent and all the way down to the tee to the little movements. He's got great timing with his takedowns. Of course, a longer reach than Johnny Hendricks. But, uh, man, uh, to, be, to me, just because he's a good friend and, and, and one of the best, I would say George. Well, speaking about the fight, uh, Stephen, Johnny Hendricks was on our program and he said about fighting you, I know I can out-wrestle him. He doesn't know the wrestling that I do, but can I outstrike him? I do believe I can because I've done it and I've proven it time and time again with really, really good strikers. I mean, what goes through your mind when you hear him say something like that? You know, I, I don't let it phase me. You know, uh, of course, he's a fighter and he's going to have all the confidence in the world going out there. If he doesn't, he shouldn't be out there, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I'm going to go out there and do what I do best. You know, I'm going to try and keep it standing on my feet. And that's what people and the fans want to see. They want to see a good, a good, uh, a good clean knockout. And that's what makes the sport so exciting. Um, you know, I know he's, he's definitely the best wrestler I've faced so far. Um, you know, I've brought in really good guys, really good wrestlers, Olympic wrestlers, uh, coming in to help me with this fight with my takedown defense. Um, so I, I feel confident and you know what, he may take me down, but guess what? I'm going to pop right back up, right back where, and every round starts standing. So he's got to worry about that. Do you believe that he'll try and fight you in the striking department, like he's mentioned in the interview with us and other interviews? Or do you think he's, it's just sort of a play and really he'll just go straight for the takedown because he knows your credentials in the striking area? Uh, I hope he does. <laughs> I hope he stands there and wants to bang with me. Um, yeah, I think he's going to play it smart. You know, he wants to get that title belt, and so do I. So I think he's going to, you know, use his striking, use that left hand, uh, to get me leaning back, to get me to the cage, to take me down. I think that's his strategy. Um, he, there may be points and uh, spots out there during the fight where he may want to stand and bang with me in the middle. You know, of course, it's always my goal to keep it keep it there. But um, you know, we're working really hard on the wrestling, working really hard on movement, uh, distance management. Um, you know, using my strikes to keep him at bay. Now, Stephen, many people have been talking about this fight as, as a mismatch with obviously Hendricks being a heavy favorite. How do you see this fight going? Where do you think you, you have the va advantage over him? Well, obviously, I believe it's it's uh, standing, you know, mm -hmm. in the striking area. Um, using my legs to keep him at bay. Uh, using my movement and my long reach and timing. Uh, I know he's, he's very difficult to knock out. Um, so I have to be precise. Every technique that I throw has got to be on point. Um, and, uh, you know, I just gotta, I just gotta beat him to the punch. You know, he likes to throw those big looping punches and the fastest point for me to be is in a straight line. So if I can beat him to the punch, I know I've got him. So when it comes to the striking, um, you know, I just gotta, I gotta use my distance and, and use my timing and speed. I think that's where, that's where it lies. And, um, you know, and make sure my shots count. You know, if I hit him in the head or if I don't hit him in the right spot, he, I, I've seen him, I mean, he's taken the champion shots, you know, mm. Robbie Lawler, Robbie Lawler is a heavy, he's one of those types of guys who, you know, one of those one hitter quitter type dudes, he hits you one shot and you're out. And he took a lot of shots, a lot of punishment from Lawler and kept on coming. So, but you know what? It doesn't bother me one bit. You know, I've faced guys like that before. It's interesting because a lot of people love to do MMA math out there. For example, this guy beat this guy, so that means this guy's going to beat that guy. And obviously, you had some issues against Mad Brown, and Johnny Hendricks absolutely destroyed Mad Brown in their fights. A lot of people are saying, look, if Wonderboy had issues against Mad Brown, then he'll definitely have issues against uh, Hendricks. But looking back at where you were in that Mad Brown fight and where you are now, would you say that you're a completely different fighter when it comes to your grappling skills? Oh, definitely. You know, that was almost four years ago um, when I faced Matt Brown. And, of course, you know, like I was like I was saying then, uh, we learned a lot from that with the weight cut and the wrestling. And, and I, I think I'm a, uh, definitely a different fighter than I was then when it comes to the ground and the takedown defense. And I think my other fights have shown that, you know, facing Johnny Hitt, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Jake Ellenberger, um, mm. you know, facing Patrick Cote. And, you know, these guys are veterans, been in the game for a long time. And, you know, um, so I feel that in my heart, I am better than I, I'm, I'm way better. And, um, you know, I'm just getting ready mentally, physically, emotionally for February 6th. Well, you've beaten, obviously, Robert Whitaker, who's currently at middleweight and is having a very successful run. Patrick Cote is having a very good run at the moment. Obviously, the Jake Allenberger knockout was, was you know, nothing short of spectacular. And, and now you're facing Hendricks, who many people think was the true number one contender in the division. If you beat him, do you think you'll be calling out Robbie Lawler for a title shot? Yes, and I think it depends on how I beat uh, Johnny Hendricks. Um, 
you know, if it goes to a decision, if it's an unanimous decision, of course, I feel like I, um, you know, I wouldn't try and go for that title shot. If it's a, if it's a knockout, definitely, you know, I'm going to be calling Lawler out. And <clears throat> over a win over jo- over Johnny Hendricks, you know, I'm going to be pushing it. You know, I, I think, you know, the top four guys except for Tyron Woodley has fought for the title. Why not give the new guy a crack at it, you know? Mm. Yeah, well, you versus Robbie would be a great matchup because stylistically it would be a striking war. If you did get a chance to fight Robbie, do you believe you'd have a striking advantage? Um, yes. I mean, <clears throat> compared to my style, the way Lawler uh, fights, he likes to stand right there in front of you. And I love to fight guys that stand right there in front of you. You know, uh, my goal is to use the angles and just pick them apart, you know, using my legs and feet together. Uh, he likes to throw his hands. He doesn't use his legs very much, of course. I think he's, he does a few head kick knockouts, but he telegraphs it a lot. But you know what? Like He's a champion, man. He's a champion for a reason. So I would not – I never take anybody lightly. Um, this is just kind of what from what I'm seeing right now. Um, of course, you know, you can say that about fighters and then be completely different – uh, feel when you get out there in, 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 in the octagon, you know? Hmm. But uh, I do, I feel that I do have a striking advantage. Now, from everything that we've seen, and, and obviously speaking to you, it's very apparent, you're you're a really nice guy, don't like to talk a lot of trash talk. Do you think at all, Stephen, it's held your career back as, you know, although you've been on a winning streak, you don't necessarily get as much attention as, say, you know, the Conor McGregor's, the, the Michael Bisping's of the company? Yeah, man, you know, I think so. I'm just not that kind of person. I've never been really good at, at, at uh, talking crap. Mm-mm. Maybe I can hire somebody to do it for me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I've just never never been that guy. you know. And, of course, you see these guys like you know Bisbing and Conor McGregor who are just killing it right now. Uh, and it's because – and a lot of it has to do with um, you know, beating their opponents mentally. You know, getting in their head with their words. You know, he's – you know, McGregor is one of the – you know, he's very – good with his words you know he's um he's very intelligent but uh you know that's just not who i am and if i go at, go in there and start trying to do that now people will just be like what are you trying to do steven mm-hmm. <laughs> you know sit down don't do that you know uh, if i if i ever if i came into the sport doing it then i believe so um you know it would be different but you know running a a martial arts school and being a the head kids instructor here you know at my family's business it's just you know, it's just not who I am and not what, what I'm about and what I want to teach, you know? Mm. It's interesting because you mentioned that you want to call out Robbie Law if you do beat Johnny Hendricks, but also do it in a respectful way. Do you find yourself sort of at, at war with yourself trying to figure out what the sort of nicest way to do that would be, but also knowing that you do have to sort of shake things up a bit for people to take notice and actually want to give you that title shot? How will you go about, if you do win that fight, sort of stay true to yourself, but also sort of shake things up a little bit because unless you sort of get the attention of the media and the people, it's more, more likely that someone else will get the next title shot. Yeah, you know, I think you can go about it the right way and still kind of shake it up a little bit without mm-hmm. actually, you know, um, you know, talking about your opponent or, or, or you know, be less than him. Um, I think, you you know, got to be confident in what you want. You know, over a win over Johnny Hendricks, I'm going to go up and I'm just going to say, hey, listen, I want Robbie Lawler. I think I'm the guy to beat him. And you know that's not that's not really talking crap. I just feel that that you know uh, I can I can do that. You know, uh, so being confident and just telling everybody exactly what you want, I think can get it done and come across to everybody and really get um, you know eyes on it. So um, that's what I'm going to do. You know, I'm not going to go out there and can I please fight Robbie Lawler? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, it just would. It just I don't think that would get it. Yeah, no. don't don't beg. Begging doesn't go over well. Well, some, someone who's no. been very, very confident in telling people what he wants and how he's going to do it, and we talked about trash talking Conor McGregor, and you know he's expressed interest in fighting for the welterweight title after he you know is planning on winning the lightweight title. You know that's stepping into your yard. How do you think he'd fare in your weight class? Well, you know he walks around about 180 pounds, and uh, he looks massive. I mean, you know, you know he's he's. Of course, there's a lot of short, shorter guys in the 170 division. You know, Johnny Henderson being one of them, he's like five nine, mm. and uh, and he, and you know he's he's crushing it, and um, you know I think he would do well. I mean, his striking's great. Um, I think he would just he would have to put on some muscle just because the guys in the division are just so much bigger. You know, they're walking around at 195, some of them 200, and if you're at 180, yeah, you'll get down to the weight pretty much easier. You know, pretty easy. But man, I mean. The guys in this division, look at Robbie Lawler. Look how massive that guy is, mm. you know? And he's got great striking as well. So, I mean, I, I think he would do fairly well. Um, 
that would be very interesting, you know, just to just to see. I think, you know, that's what he's looking for. Everybody wants to see how he's going to stack up to these, you know, the 155 and the 170. So that's going to sell tickets. Well, it's interesting because it almost seems like you're going to be right in the thick of it if he does do it. So we have to ask, since it would be an unreal matchup, how do you, how would you see a fight between you and McGregor going if he does make the jump to welterweight? Obviously, you know, his striking is very, very dangerous, but you yourself have a pedigree, you know, close to none in the, in the division as well. Yeah, man, we have we have fairly similar style with our stances when, you know, putting our, our, our kicks and hands together. He likes to throw side kicks. I like to throw side kicks, hook kicks, you know, things that you normally don't see in a sparring session. You know, mm. people aren't used to seeing that. And and he that's why we catch guys with it. I think it would be a very exciting fight, to be honest with you. And it would definitely be a striking war. But I've been I, I just feel like I'm, I'm more experienced when it comes to that style. Um, I think I have more tools. You know, he likes to keep his right side forward. I work both sides. I think I have more weapons in my arsenal than he does. So uh, that said, I think I would come out with a win, but it would be a really, it would be really cool to go out there and fight. You know, the best guys, man. You know, and he's definitely one of them. He's he's shaking it up. He's literally the Muhammad Ali of MMA right now. Wow, that's that's huge praise. Just quickly, Stu. I mean, we've mentioned the trash talk. Do you think that if you do end up fighting him? Uh, the trash talk would affect you mentally in the fight because we've seen how much it affected his previous opponents. How much of a factor for that would, would that be for you? And how would you handle dealing with the trash talk of caliber of a Conor McGregor? You know, um, I've been fighting since I was 15 years old and there have been all sorts of characters that I've faced. And, um, you know, I, for some reason, it, it's never bothered me at all. I know why they're doing it, you know, and I and I and I know what what, you know, why they're why they're they're trash talking to hype the fight up to try and get to break me mentally, and I just don't let it happen, you know. I'm myself, and um, you know, I'm very strong mentally and emotionally, you know. I, I don't I don't like to think I'm I'm weak in in those areas, uh, and I know that's that's what you know Conor McGregor he may or may not do that, you know. You know, I've had a, have had the chance to talk with him, hang out with him for a little bit in some of the shows, and he's a really nice guy. And um, but unless you're facing him, you know, it's just something mm. that changes. Uh, but you know, I, I I don't care. I really don't care what he says or what anybody says about me in the division or who I'm fighting. You know, and what does matter is what happens in that octagon. Well, Stephen, you say you're mentally tough, but we've got your toughest challenge in front of you just yet. It's the Submission Radio Tap Out Round. Uh, basically, a fun game we play. Very simple. We ask a bunch of fun questions, and you answer with the first thing that comes to mind. So, are you ready? Oh, yeah. Let's do it. All right. Wonderboy Thompson is stuck on a desert island. Name three things he brings with him. I bring with me stuck on an island. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I would bring water, an Xbox One, and a hot chick. Xbox mm. One. Where, where are you plugging this <laughs> Xbox One in there? Are you going to plug it into a coconut I have tree no or something? Idea. <laughs> <laughs> everything. There's got to be electricity. See, bro. There's like a I kiosk there on this deserted island. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's sitting there with the water and the hot chick looking at the Xbox going, I don't think I thought this through. Yeah. Now, next, next question. Give us your favorite line from a movie. My favorite line from a movie. Wow. Oh, man. Uh, I'm definitely a movie buff, but I've never actually had a favorite line. Um, I don't know. I'll be back. <laughs> That's the first thing that popped in my head. Well, it's it's I'll a, be back. It's a classic, so it's not, it's not a bad one. Uh, now, driving your Toyota Super, we have to ask you to rank your top three Fast and the Furious movies. Top three Fast and the Furious movies? Mm. Well, the number one, just because it's the classic. It was the mm. very first one that got it, that got it all started. Mm. Okay? Number one, uh, definitely did, the second one was horrible. They should just, I just threw that away. Um... I like the last three movies, to be honest with you. Really? The last three. Yes, I, I did. I mean, the last one was okay. I mean, there was a little – I mean, all the Fast and Furious uh, stunts, they're fairly – they're far-fetched. Yeah. You know, a lot of this stuff, is, it's not realistic, but that's the way those movies are, and that's what makes them the Fast and Furious movies, you know? Um, I did like Tokyo Drift, to be honest with you. That was probably the most realistic one out of all of them. Mm. You know, with the car, with the with the, with the stunts and everything, but uh, yeah, man, one, I would say the first one, Tokyo Drift, and uh, I think it was Fast and Furious Five was was legit. I, w- I will say this though, two things. You mentioned you like Tokyo Drift. I love how in the last movie, I think it was they they took that footage from Tokyo Drift 
and didn't change it at all. And then they brought that guy back in from Tokyo Drift and he'd aged like a thousand years and as if they oh, expected no one to notice. And it's like, dude, are you serious? Not only that, but I, I mean, I'm sure you noticed, but it just seems like the first Fast and the Furious was like the most simple, basic movie. There were like young kids, whatever, early 20s, they were just racing. And then by the by the last one, they're like secret agents. You've got The Rock, like pulling off a oh, gun, no, they're going international, like, I don't know, it, it, it's a bit And much. they go from, like, high, you know, level criminals to, to you know, the good guys, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, well, the worst the worst part, I reckon, I think this was, this was the last movie, was when Jason Statham and Vin Diesel ended up in that <laughs> yeah. car park, and they're like, all right, how are we going to do this? And they decide to drive into each other to see who's toughest, I mean. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that was just nuts, ridiculous. Man. It was like, dude, yeah. are you thinking? Crazy. I don't know. You need to speak to Vin Diesel about this. I know that he wears a lot of sunglasses indoors when he goes to UFC events, but you need to sort of open his eyes to the realism of driving. <laughs> now, moving on to the next question. <laughs> you were a zombie in the Ranger 15 movie. Out of all the zombies, Josh Thompson, Phil Davis, Stephen Bonner, who made the best one and who made the worst one? Oh, wow. Ah, okay. There was a um, – Keith Jardine. You guys know who Keith Jardine yeah, is? Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Keith Jardine was – he literally looked like the scariest dude out of the bunch. All right? And then he put he the zombie makeup def- on. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Then he, put- <laughs> he was massive. He looked like one of those just crazy zombies, man. I would say he was probably one of the best. Mm-hmm. Worst. Oh, man. I would have to say Phil Davis, man. He's such a comic. He's a yeah. comedian, dude. He, he, when I look at him, he just made me laugh. Like he didn't scare me one bit. Mm. You know, I look at him, he just he just cracked me up. So Keith Jardine, I would say the scariest. Phil Davis, the worst zombie. <laughs> yeah, there's a big difference between Phil Davis's goatee and and Keith Jardine's. Now, uh, this is breaking news. Well, sort of, but not really. Bill Murray is officially running for president. Will Wonderboy consider uh, him during the voting process? <laughs> Oh, if he does, that I mean, that's classic. Let's do it. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm checking him. He's definitely president. <laughs> yeah, well, any, any, anything's better than Trump, right? Now, moving on to the next question: What is the best karate movie of all time? The best, the best karate karate movie, mm. or yeah, just martial arts in general? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I should. I don't know. All right, let's do martial arts in general. Okay. Because if you do karate, it just has to be Karate Kid. I right. Mean, yeah. Just, that's, that's, know, that's just, just a stock standard given. answer. Yep. Huh. One of my favorites, uh, Marsh, of course, I love the Matrix trilogy. You know, of course, the last two movies I didn't like. The first one was mm. the best. Mm. Um, man, I, I, have you ever seen Jackie Chan, The Drunken Master? No. I've seen, I've seen some you clips from You have not seen it. that? No, we no. haven't seen I've seen some clips. I haven't watched it from start to finish. This is when he was quite a bit younger, wasn't it? Yeah, man. Yeah. It, it's legit. Like, the fight scenes there are really are awesome. Where, what do you, which one are you guys? I mean, what do y'all, what, what do you think? Well, you know, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Nice favorite. Guy was shot in Melbourne, which is where this show comes from. Mm. So there's a, there's a few no trams there. Yeah, there, there's some trams, Melbourne. But I don't know. You're flipping the question on us. This isn't how the tap out route works, <laughs> Stephen. <laughs> quite yeah. frankly, I'm, I'm, I'm going to save us both and throw in like the typical. Uh, this is like the super mainstream answer, but Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I remember watching that as a kid oh, and being yeah, like, yeah, like, like I don't know whether it was before Matrix or after Matrix, but it, it was it was pretty amazing, the fight scenes at the time. Yeah. I have to say, like, recently, in, in the last year, I really, in, and I don't know if this really classifies as a as a martial arts movie, and Keith Jardine's in I know what one, you're going to say. John, uh, John Wick was a really good movie. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. That had some oh, good fight yeah. scenes as well, yeah. It was pretty cool because you had, you know, you had some judo in it, you had some jujitsu throwing all my platas in there. Yeah. My uh, my brother-in-law Carlos Machado's brother Hegan did a lot of the stunt choreograph uh, for that for the fight for the fight scene. So it was pretty cool. Wait, who was your brother-in-law? I, th- I know they're coming out with. Uh, say that again. Who is your brother-in-law? Uh, Carlos Machado. Wow, Carlos Machado is your brother-in-law. Holy crap! Yeah, he's actually right outside the door right now. He's <laughs> he came in this week to for my camp. So yeah, man. Wow. He married my sister. They got four kids together, and they all tra- started training at the age of three as well. Holy crap. Star started. All right. Well, we're not going to take up your whole time, Stephen. We've got two more questions, then we'll get out of your hair. Uh, Chuck Norris had you as the number one ranked fighter in 2006 in the World Combat League. Give us your favorite Chuck Norris joke. For example, all right, and, and we'll start you off here. Uh, there used to be a street named after Chuck Norris, but it was changed because nobody crosses Chuck Norris and lives. Or... <laughs> or... It gets better. If you see Chuck Norris crying, he will grant you a wish. If your wish is dying, 
<laughs> oh my gosh. Now it's your turn. My, my favorite Chuck Norris. You know, I used to know a hundred of them things like a hundred years ago. I don't remember any of them now. Um, I think it was, what, what, I don't I don't remember how it goes because I'm just going to destroy it. I just know I am. Mm-hmm. It had something to do with a giraffe or something, him uppercutting a horse uh, yep. and it becoming a giraffe. Do you remember how that one goes? Yep, yep, yep. I don't yep. remember how it goes. Well, that sounds uh, about right. If he, if he uppercutted a horse, it would become a giraffe. That, that, was, that, was, that was one of the ones that always made the cut. Yeah. I like I like Chuck Norris, destro- uh, was it destroy the periodic table because he only recognized the element of surprise? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good, nice, nice. Now, finally, soon. One, uh, yeah, go no, ahead. no, go on, go on. We want to hear the other one, go. All right, Chuck Norris was was an only child, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> right, I've got I've got one quickly. Uh, when Chuck Nor- when Chuck Norris left for college, he told his dad, "Now you're the man of the house." Uh, <laughs> another good one was when Chuck Norris turned 18, 18, His parents moved out of the house. <laughs> Is that what it went? I like that one. Now, finally, we're going to let you go because we're having a lot of fun, but we know you got a big fight coming up. Give us your prediction. How are you winning against Johnny Hendricks at UFC one ninety six? Me, I'm gonna go out there. I'm gonna put my hands and feet together. I'm gonna knock him out. That's what's gonna happen. I'm not gonna call a. I'm not gonna call a, a round. Y'all just gonna have to tune in and check it out. Well, there you go, guys. Well, follow Stephen on Twitter at Wonderboy MMA, and of course, see him take on Johnny Hendricks at UFC 196. Uh, it's gonna be February 6th in America, and due to the time difference, Sunday the February 7th uh, here in Australia. Stephen, it's been an absolute pleasure. I feel like we've learned a lot about you, uh, especially not only just fighting, but especially your movie tastes and uh, your elite level of Chuck Norris jokes. So thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Hey, guys, it's a pleasure, and hopefully we can do it again sometimes. Y'all have a good one. Hey, what's up, guys? This is Smooth Benson Henderson. You're listening to Submission Radio. All right, guys. Our next guest is one of the world's most recognizable bantamweights, a former champion and title contender. He looks like he's next in line to once again fight for the UFC title. He's the California kid, Uriah Faber. Uriah, welcome back to the program. How's it going today? Doing good. How are you guys? Very well, Uriah. So, of course, we have to start by talking about last week's fight between TJ Dillashaw and Dominic Cruz. After the fight, Twitter blew up and everybody seemed to have a different opinion on who won. Just wondering, how did you score the fight and who did you think won that one? You know, I thought it was a very close fight. Mm -hmm. But uh, I did have TJ, uh, uh, Dominic Cruz winning. I thought just because of the amount he made TJ miss, and then he was actually connecting himself with a lot of punches. And... And then getting the, the takedowns as well, so that, that's how we edged each, each round out. And I, I thought it could have either been three to two crews or four to one crews, depending on how they scored. I gave the fourth round to TJ, and felt like TJ was moving forward a lot more, but Cruz was backing up and landing, and TJ was moving forward and missing. So I think he missed like 300 strikes or something like that. And so, you know, that in itself is was pretty impressive. That he could throw that many strikes and miss because it's actually more tiring to, to, to miss than it is mm. to actually hit. Mm. So, uh, you know, hard fought fight, but I had Cruz winning four to one. What did you think of the way Cruz looked upon his return? Were you surprised considering the time he spent away from the cage? Because that was the biggest question. How's he going to look? What did you think? Were you surprised at all? No, I mean, we saw him fight. It hasn't been that long since he fought. I mean, he's only fought once in four years, but. It wasn't that long since he fought, and he looked really good in his last return. Mm. I mean, you're either training and getting better when you're out, or you're uh, doing nothing. And it's obviously he's been training. So I, I'm not a big believer in the ring rust either. I, I mean, I believe in in mental rust, meaning you don't want it anymore. Mm-hmm. But uh, it was obvious that he did. Mental rust. That's a good term. I'm going to put that in the book. Now, TJ Dillashaw mentioned that he felt like Joe Rogan's commentary was biased towards Cruz in the fight, saying that he picked Cruz before the fight. Obviously, all you guys are pretty close to Joe Rogan. What did you think of those comments? You know what? I haven't watched the commentary. I I watched the fight again when I got home, but I always watch it in mute because I like to see... I just don't like to be swayed by by conversation. Mm -hmm. So I like to see who was winning... And uh, I'll go back and watch it with the commentary, but uh, especially later at night, I can't watch fights and uh, and have the full stimulation. So I was it was late enough at night where I could just watch the the, the fight without all the action of the commentary and the sounds and et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'll watch it again and, and see because 
I've felt that way before. I mean, I've always kept it as a private conversation or said something to Joe Rogan myself. Um, but I, I know that Joe Rogan likes TJ a lot, you know, from what, from what I understand they're they've been pretty close. They've, they've, uh, worked on stuff together with on it. And, and mm-hmm. I know that, you know, Rogan's always been a big fan of TJ. So I would be shocked to see if, if it was really biased. I mean, the truth is TJ missed a lot, you know? So mm. I, I could see maybe, uh, him pointing that out and, and um, but I'll, I'll have to watch it to have a real opinion. It's interesting that you mentioned that you watch it with the sound off. And we get a lot of people, by the way, saying, look, I watched the fight with the sound off. And nothing against Joe Rogan and Mike Goldberg because they do a great job, but everybody's human. And sometimes, you know, it does seem like in certain fights, they may be a bit biased. Do, do you think that's a bit of an issue sometimes in a fight? Like you mentioned, you privately said a few things to Joe Rogan, but sort of commentary uh, pushing the viewers to think a fight sort of turned out in a certain way that it hasn't? I've seen that a bunch. I don't know if it's intentional or it's just, mm. you know, someone having an opinion. And I mean, that's their job is to, to talk about what they're seeing in a fight. So if they're seeing that, you can't really hold it against them. I don't necessarily think it's anything like planned out or deliberate, but it's one person's opinion a lot of times. So mm. uh, it can be frustrating as a fighter that really knows what's going on in there. I've, I've, I've seen like, I remember with, when I fought Jorge Rivi- or, uh, Riviera, mm-hmm. Um, Francisco just being Francisco Riviera I landed more strikes and won the round on all judges scorecards Mm -hmm. and the commentary was just like making a huge deal about a leg kick that didn't hurt at all and like and like I feel like I got hit maybe twice in the whole round and and the way the commentary was going was getting me frustrated but you know they got to make storylines they got to make it interesting they got to talk about what they're seeing in there so it is what it is. It, it can be frustrating. I, I feel TJ mm. if, if, if it was true. I mean, it, it's it's a, a kick in a horse while it's down kind of. Mm-hmm. You mentioned before to us how awkward the whole situation was with you potentially fighting TJ. And, you know, even though it wouldn't, it, it would have been a big fight, you didn't exactly love the idea. Are you somewhat happy that, you know, you don't have to deal with fighting your former training partner and friend in TJ now? Yeah, I mean, the truth <laughs> is we have a lot of mutual friends. There's still guys on the team that are real close with him. I mean, he was one of my very good friends and uh do this not out of anger i don't like fighting out of anger or or out of animosity or having you know a bunch of drama involved i I do this because i love it because it's a fun process and when that disappears it just takes some of the some of the the fun factor out of it so for me i don't think uh i mean i'm not going to not fight him for a belt of course but it's not it's not something i was looking forward to uh I sure as hell would plan on putting my all into it and have a little more edge and emotion into it. But, um, you know, that's for the, at the, when everything's on the line. Mm, absolutely. Well, Dwayne Ludwig recently appeared on the MMA hour and said Faber barely beat a tough journeyman in his last fight against Frankie Sainz. He doesn't deserve to fight a top five guy. Uh, when asked about the possibility of fighting Cruz, what do you make of those comments? And do you feel like you've obviously done enough for the shot? That guy at 135 pounds, being a, a Division One wrestler, and ranked number 12 in the world, or whatever he's ranked, and he hasn't fought any of the guys in the top 10 except for Yuri Alcantara, who he beat. Um, I would like to see Dwayne go one round with that guy and see how he does against him. And and <laughs> the guy's a the guy's a jackal, man. I mean, where does he get off? I mean, I know he, he fought in the UFC and, and you know, he, he did okay here and there, but uh, where does he get off saying anything about my positioning in this world? Hmm. Dad. It's interesting, and I, I really want to get your thoughts on this. While we're on the topic of Dwayne, I don't want to mull too much on it, but the other big thing that came out of the interview was him saying, in my eyes, I don't think Faber ever did much for TJ. If you want to put on a loyalty stamp, I felt like I've done a lot more than Faber has, that's for sure. You know, having built up TJ in Team Alpha Male for such a long time and obviously training with him for years and years and years, you know, did, did those comments bother you? What did you think of those? And I, I, I don't want to sort of ask you to compare the two, but how, how does that stack up as far as truth-wise goes? I'm not going to, I'm not even going to acknowledge it. I didn't listen to the interview. I don't, I don't care what he thinks, <laughs> period. And I don't care. I don't, I mean, TJ knows what the deal is. I'll just leave it at that. Mm. 
Well, we also wanted to ask you before we saw somewhere that Joseph Benavides and Lars Palmer, two longtime staples of Team Alpha Male, have been going down to train with TJ in Colorado. With everything that's happening with you and TJ, we're wondering, how do you feel about that? Did you guys discuss it before they went down there? Yeah, I've talked. I mean, I just I just did a workout with Lance this morning, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, it, here's the truth. And I, and I said this from the get-go, get-go from TJ. You can't be on both teams. But I'm not going to try to stop any type of friendships or anything else like that. We already – TJ was already crossing, crossing over and doing cross-training. He did that because Dwayne had refused to come to our gym – for whatever reason, because he was building his own facility, so there's no problem with guys going to other places. If they don't, they don't want to claim our gym. That's a different story. If they don't want to be a part of our team. That's a different story. But you know, these guys, I don't control these guys. The reason this team has has been built is because, and I've talked to my guys about this, is because instead of me going out and having my fights from the very beginning of my career, and and then going on vacation until I'm ready to train again. I came back and gave back. You know, I, I was there for the younger guys. I, I put money into to, to getting coaches there, and I put money into a facility and I did these different things to help build this team. And and this this team continues because guys are doing that as well. Yesterday in practice, we had seven coaches in practice. We had Coach Joey, our boxing coach. We had uh, Justin Buckles and Chris Holdsworth, and we had – Dustin Akbari, we had Fabio Prado, we had myself, we had, uh, you know, Lance Palmer, we have Justin Buckles, we have all these guys in here having a rich environment that is, is pushing towards the next generation, and, and we're excited for that. Mm-hmm. Lance, is, Lance is here, you know, uh, mm-hmm. Buckles is here, and, and it's funny because Buckles was, uh, was asked to be in TJ's corner, which, I mean, I can understand TJ wants to have some, some I mean, he he was built in our, in our gym. I understand he wants to have some semblance of where he comes from in his, in his, uh, in his corner, but Buckles didn't work with him at all for that camp, and he's been in his corner every fight mm. uh, prior to that. Um, so, I mean, it was more of just like, you know, having a little bit of support, and Buckles had talked to me about that, and he's, he stepped up as, as one of the head coaches at our team, along with Chris Holdsworth and, and some of the other guys that, have been there for a long, long time. So um, I don't care about other people's friendships. I, it's not about that. You just can't be on both teams. That's it. Mm. Well, and not claim our team. Sure. Let's move on. Let's talk about the fight between yourself and, and Cruz. This fight was supposed to happen almost four years ago. And by the time it happens, assuming it does, it may very well be four years. How happy are you to finally get this fight and complete this trilogy and rubber match? And has it been sort of in the back of your mind all this time since Tough? Of course. You know, it's funny. Uh, we stumbled upon each other's numbers. I think what happened was when Cruz got injured, he wanted to be the one to tell me himself that he was out of this fight because there's been so much buildup. We fought twice. We had the reality show, etc. And we've been talking crap to each other ever since. Mm. I mean, every time we see each other, we're talking crap. Every once in a while, just a stab. I get a stab from a, you know, from a text message. This has been nine years in the making. And wow. it's funny because you get all these people that don't understand the history. We've got a lot of newbies that are, that are into that sport. We don't understand. Uh, our last fight, in my opinion, could have gone either way. I, I put him to the canvas two, two or three times, uh, rocked him a couple times. I did not have trouble catching him or tracking him down. Um, some short-lived takedowns was maybe the difference, maybe a little bit more in the punch stats, but my, our last fight was very, very close, and I feel like I could have won. The fight mm. before that was was nine years ago, and it was uh, a submission finish. So we have this history, and uh, I haven't been this motivated in a long time. I haven't had uh, a rival in the sport other than Cruz my entire career. Mm. So uh, it just makes sense for me. Mm. What did you think when you saw Dominic's foot was bugging him at the end of the fight and afterwards? Because there was for a moment there, everybody's eyes widened like, oh, no, not again. You know, Cruz might be injured. What did you think when you saw the fact that he had a bit of a foot injury? Yeah, I was a little nervous, but I think he got cleared, <laughs> right? So uh, we're all good. Well, when do you think the two of you will fight? What kind of turnaround are you looking for? And, you know, do you think it might take a while, you know, with Dominic possibly needing to heal his foot? Um, yeah, it'd probably take a while. I actually have a little rib injury myself and, and need to work on a couple things myself. So I, I'm not too, I'm not too worried about, you know, how long we're going to wait. I've been waiting a long time. <laughs> mm. You know what I mean? 
So it's not like uh, a little weight's going to bother me. And, and uh, at this point in my career, I want those fights, you know, the ones that matter. I want to fight for the title. I want to fight uh, a rival, one a person we have a storyline with, someone that I know I can beat. Mm. Well, for those newbies that have just come into the sport, you know, some people are saying because you lost to Barrow twice and TJ beat Barrow twice and he couldn't beat Cruz, the odds might be stacked against you. Do you feel like you're being counted out at all for some of these new fans going into this fight with Cruz? Uh, it doesn't matter. People don't understand what kind of warriors they're dealing with. I've been 13 years on a, on an MMA path, 24 years as an athlete in the wrestling world, and uh, almost 28 years as an athlete at high level between football and hockey, etc. This is This is one of the top warriors on the planet, and internet warriors and real warriors don't see eye to eye. So whoever, if there's any doubters in there, they just don't understand. This is the game of, of anybody's day. Uh, they could also say, I beat Asunto, Asunto beat TJ. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, the other thing is I, I took a fight with Burrell because Cruz got injured. Went on two weeks notice and had a torn hamstring and was, they got stopped early. So, I mean, there's a story to every single, uh, every single battle and, and uh, I'm one of the top fighters in the world. I've been setting records. Uh, I think I have the most submissions in the history of the WC Pride and UFC together. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, this is this is something I've dedicated my life to, and it's going to come to fruition when I get that belt. You talked about the story. There's, there is a huge story. Like you mentioned, nine years, four, four years almost since the last time you fought. You fought really tough guys in your last fights. Like you mentioned, Francisco Rivera, uh, Frankie Sides, but not really guys with big names. How do you feel about finally having a big name opponent again and you know potentially being in that main event? Well, let's, let's think about, and then I'll ask you, in the 135-pound division, minus Dominic Cruz, and myself, who are the big names? Well, if we're talking big names, I mean, there's TJ, there's yourself, and there's and there's Dominic Cruz. There's a lot of fantastic fighters, but I guess I would say there's a lot of, you know, I guess yeah, I guess are up no, and comers, but not necessarily no big, stars. I, I, I've been I've been in the same position my entire career where there are no big names. I've been the biggest name, hmm. period. Even if you look at it, like right now, notoriety. Uh, there's some great fighters out there, but as far as uh, what the average person at home knows. You know, there aren't any big names. You know, there's 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 a couple people that people know, and there's there's me. You know, that's mm. it. Uh, mm. So it's not something new. The uh, the other thing to think about is, I don't know how many. You know, my my only loss I've had as of late is against Frank Yeager, who's the number one contender at the weight above me, and we had a five round fight that was, you know, edged out to him because of some more, you know, a couple more takedowns, but uh, a super close fight. I mean, I guess the question is, you know, what what else makes sense? Mm, right. I mean, not too much else. And Uriah, we know we have to let you go in just a moment. But before we do, just something a bit fun. Obviously, another matchup that did make sense not too long ago, something that you wanted. Obviously, your opposing coach on the, on the Ultimate Fighter, Conor McGregor, he's now saying that he wants to move up to welterweight and fight for the belt. I uh, just want to also get your take and your initial reaction. What do you think about that? And do you think he stands a chance against, you know, a guy like Robbie Lawler? <laughs> you never count anybody out, but no. I mean, I don't think so, but, I mean, it, who knows? Maybe, I, I don't know how heavy the guy gets walking around. If he gets up to 190 pounds and then cuts down to 170, yeah, I could see that. I mean, he's a young guy. Maybe he's still growing, whatever. Um, but I think he should worry about RDA first. He's, he's got a hole in his game, whether he wants to admit it or not. His wrestling is a factor. His grappling is a factor. Uh, maybe maybe the one punch hitter quitter is gonna is gonna help against RDA. Probably not. He's gonna really have to focus on his grappling for any of these big matches moving up. Because we saw it with Chad Mendes, man. Chad Mendes showed a little weakness. Mm. And just very quickly before we let you go, obviously that is one of the big fights you were talking about. There was Cruz, Dillashaw, McGregor. McGregor's going up to lightweight. Is it safe to say that fight is sort of out of mind for the time being? You focus on Cruz, or is it something that you'd still, you know, consider and be interested in later down the line? You know, the biggest thing for me is getting the belt at one thirty-five. Mm. Uh, you know, in my opinion, both both TJ and Cruz did not look as physically impressive as they have in the last fights. If you look at their their body structure, everything else, TJ looks smaller. 
Cruz looks flabbier. I'll tell you right now, I'm going to look the same. I've looked the same my whole life. Uh, and I think you're going to see the best me, and I don't know if it's going to be the best them. Well, there you guys go. The California kid, they call him that for a reason. Make sure to follow Uriah on Twitter, at Uriah Faber. Uriah, always a pleasure having you on the program. Thanks for coming back onto Submission Radio. You got it. And there you guys go, Uriah Faber. Always a pleasure having him on the program, a Submission Radio alumni. And very interested to see what's going to happen for him in 2016. But speaking of hot topics in 2016, we have a very, very special guest joining us for a breakdown. His name is David St. Martin. He's from MMA Fighting. He's coming back on the program, and you may know him from his amazing morning reports. Dave, welcome back to Submission Radio. No problem. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Well, the pleasure is all ours. Now, we'll get right into it. We're going to be breaking down a bunch of hot topics in the world of MMA. We're going to kick it off first with Tony Ferguson. He's a man who we all thought would be getting a big name in his next fight, whether it be Khabib or a spectacle against Anthony Pettis. However, this weekend or this week, it was confirmed that he is fighting Michael Johnson for a second time at UFC 197. In the first fight, if people don't remember, he lost to him via decision in 2012. I want to go around and ask everybody their opinion, their initial reaction to this matchup. David, I'll go with you first. What did you think when you heard about this? Um, yeah, just just a little bit weird. And I know there was a you know a ton of an uproar about you know oh the rankings don't mean anything and how could he do that and blah 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 and all this stuff. But you know I think the you know Ariel had kind of pointed out um, you know on Twitter when it kind of came out that, you know, just timing wise, it made more sense for Tony to try to fight again before March, because I think his first child is coming in April and he did not want, you know, try to, to try to balance a camp with, you know, a couple week old baby and things like that. So I think it's just a timing thing. Um, probably feels pretty confident after his, you know, it was it seven fights in a row that he's won now. So yeah, he probably feels pretty confident against a guy that, you know, didn't look great against Nate Diaz recently. Right. So, I mean, I'm sure, uh, He'd rather get that win back, and it's a win-win for him, I think. Mm. David St. Martin, pretty much covering covering all the good points. I, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you sort Sorry. of my initial reaction. I mean, the way I sort of thought about it, and I guess most people, and I'll break it down why it doesn't really make sense because obviously Ferguson's on a seven fight win streak, and in that streak are guys like, in case you forgot, Danny Castillo, Abel Trujillo, Glayson Tibau, Josh Thompson, and most recently Edson Barboza. He's ranked number five. Johnson, on the other hand, on a two-fight losing streak, losing a controversial decision to Benil Darius and then Nate Diaz, and he's ranked lower in number seven. Tony is also currently where Johnson was a couple of fights ago when he beat Tebow, Gallard, Lozon, and Barboza, and that's pretty much knocking on the door of a title shot. These guys have basically switched places. So Ferguson should have gotten someone like Pettis, Alvarez, or Nate Diaz, even Khabib Nurmagomedov, all fights that would be a step up and the test needed, you know, for Ferguson to see if he can swim with the elite of the division. Instead, he got a guy who he he'd already lost to, who doesn't really have the momentum needed to push him closer to the the mm-hmm. title shot. That that was my initial reaction, but I understand your points, Dave. My problem with this whole situation is you have this guy who's almost like a diamond in the rough, and instead of putting him up against those guys that you mentioned, Cass, and seeing if he could sink or swim. You're sort of risking it all in a guy like Michael Johnson, who if Johnson beats Tony, nothing's really done for Johnson because he is on this two-fight losing streak. But here with Johnson, he's got this very nice streak going. And if he does beat one of the names that Casper mentioned, then bang, you have a case for a title shot and a possibly a new star in the division. Because he's, he's we've spoken about this a few times, but he's become a, tra- a pretty good trash talker as of late. Mm. And his fighting style is very, very exciting. So to me... I really thought this guy was almost like a total package. So yeah, my initial reaction, shock, awe, and disappointment. But guys, Jeremy Botter tweeted out, and he tweeted this out particularly. He writes, seems clear the UFC wants Ferguson nowhere near the title picture. He's won seven in a row. Johnson has lost two in a row. Strange. Does anybody else agree with Botter thinking this is a move to keep Tony from the title picture? I want to go with you first, Dave, and get your thoughts on it. Uh, No, not really. You know, I don't really believe in... In conspiracies to keep people away from title shots, I could see conspiracies to get people title shots, but not really to keep them away from title fights. So I, I don't, I don't see that there's some sort of weird conspiracy. I don't know why you would. I don't, I don't. Nothing, nothing about him rings alarm bells for me of why that would be. Really, you know, considering some of the, the other things that are allowed to go on. So yeah, I don't really. I didn't really make much of that. 
Maybe he's like the dog in The Simpsons with the shifty eyes. You don't know what it is about him, but there's just something about him that, that makes you suspicious. <laughs> no, Tony Ferguson, he's obviously a really exciting fighter. So, again, like you, Dave, I don't really see why they would keep him away. And, and, and what you said before and what Ariel obviously alluded to was the fact that he probably wants to fight a little bit earlier. Um, he fought in December while Pettis and Alvarez, they only just fought. So they may not be ready in less than two months, which is when UFC 197 is. Nate fought a week after Tony, but Nate hasn't really been known to fight all that often. So he, he may not be back for another six months. And Khabib, we really don't know when he'll be back. I, I think he was eyeing June, which may be a little bit too late for Tony. You said he's he's got his kid coming in April. So right. even though those are all the, the tasty and delicious options, they may not really be that viable. So when you look at that and there really aren't that many other options, Tony really got the best one. He's he's also got a tremendous amount of confidence in himself, so it's possible that he's, you know, not even entertaining the idea uh, of losing to Johnson and obviously Johnson derailing his road to the title. Mm, and it's it's one of those situations that, who are we kidding? Uh, Conor McGregor coming to the division. I don't think uh, Dana White and the boys are in the office thinking about Tony Ferguson in the long yeah. term right now. I'm really probably waiting around to see what happens with McGregor. But I will say this. If uh, he does make it up the ladder to fight McGregor one day, that is not going to be a fight. That any, I think anybody's going to miss mm. anywhere in the world. But let's move on to the next topic, guys. Chris Weidman, he said in a recent interview, he's expecting a title rematch with Luke Rockhold. Currently with Yoel dealing with a USADA violation and Vitor fighting Jacare in Brazil in May, is it a pretty much a given at this point that we'll see this rematch as Rockhold's first title defense I mean, we're talking about timing. Dave, I want to go with you first. Do you think it's likely the Whiteman will be Rockhold's opponent now that it looks like most people are taking up in the division? Yeah, I think so. I think it, it pretty much, you know, that the, the dominoes of UL going away for 9 to 12 or whatever is going to be, and then um, yeah, the the booking of Vitor Jacare, you know, basically it's just kind of processes of elimination. You know, there's just not that many fights other than that that make sense. Um Weidman probably deserves it. I, I hate to use the word deserve when it comes to this stuff and MMA and things like that, you know. But, yeah, you know, it probably probably makes sense. He's motivated for the rematch. Rockhold has said he's willing to do it again, happy to do it again, things like that, you know. So I think both neither, both, neither guy is probably going to be fighting the, that idea. They both know that that's a good um, money fight for both of them, I think. So, yeah, it makes sense. And I don't know when they would do that, but... You know, you've got the potential UFC New York coming around the corner, and that's a fight that could main event if they don't, say, go with John Jones or even be a co-main event for a landmark event like that. So I, I agree. I do feel like that's the direction they'll, they'll go with. You know, the only guys really in conversation to fight for a title 185 are Vito Belfort, Jacare Souza, Yoel Romero, and Chris Weidman. If you go any lower down the division... You're looking at Leota Machida, who's, you know, been on a horrible run recently. You know, Vitor, just to break it down a bit, Vitor would be a good matchup because he's coming off a win. And there's also a story there. They have legitimate beef. And Rockhold has wanted that fight for a long time. But the only problem is that he's really only won one fight since losing to Chris in a fight that wasn't even competitive. And obviously, Chris got beaten by Luke. Jacare lost, so he's out. Romero won, but obviously wasn't the most dominant performance and, and a lot of people think that he may have even lost to Jacare. Not to mention, you know, the fight was filled with controversies like fence grabbing. And and then that you've got the USADA potential, you know, drug, you know being flagged for, for a potential failed drug test. So he's definitely out. And even before the failed drug test, I don't think anybody really bought into him as the next title challenger. Just because how much, you know, his cardio lacked against Jacare and Rockhold obviously being known for having great cardio. So... Really, like you mentioned, Dave, through the process of elimination, that leaves the Weidman rematch. I don't really think it makes sense, but considering the timing and the matchmaking, the pickle that the UFC are in, it kind of does. And just to sort of break it down a little bit more, the first fight is actually pretty competitive. It wasn't completely rockhold from bell to bell, but we did find out the rockhold had issues with his foot and that he was sick. So I, I would never count Weidman out, but I do still think rockhold would, you know, come out a. Uh, come out with his hand raised and potentially upset the people of New York. It's interesting because obviously Casper just broke down why some of the matchups wouldn't make sense. I'm just curious. I want to go around and ask you guys if you could reconstruct the division in any way, sort of cancel out some matchups, put in, put some other matchups together. And is there one guy in the division who you'd rather see Rockhold fight next rather than Weidman? I want to go with you first, Dave. Can you Joe Silva us for a second and give us a matchup that you think would be better? Hmm. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's kind of a weird spot where I wouldn't mind seeing Rockhold Jacare again, 
Um, you know, I enjoyed those other fights in uh, Strike Force. I thought they were pretty competitive. Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't mind seeing maybe, maybe Anderson and Tim Kennedy. You know, um, mm. we've seen Vitor. I, I just, I don't, I don't know how Vitor is gonna hang with Jacare right now. You know, Machida is somewhere in there too. I don't, I don't know. You know, there's a couple of different fights to make, but yeah, it seems like it's so in flux right now. With I, I want to see how kind of. With all the USADA, just with really the IVs more than anything of where people end up settling, you know, if they end up moving up or moving down. I mean, you know, I, I watch Lito Machida spar, you know, every once in a while, and I don't understand how he even fights at 185. I mean, the guy is just not huge. So I don't know. I think the division could look different six to eight months from now, you know. When you say you, about Machida, when you say he's not huge, what do you mean? You're saying he could potentially go to welterweight? Yeah, you know, I mean, I watch him with with guys who are, um, you know, Eric Silva, Ellenberger, guys like that, Gastelum, mm. um, Uriah Hall, and he just, I don't, I, you know, you almost wonder if he couldn't make 170. I'd love to see him because I, you know, I see him spar with, you know, big guys at Kings MMA, and, um, you know, he does does well or fine or whatever. He's Lyoto Le- Machida, but yeah, you always wonder, you know. I'd love to see him kind of at some different matchups. If he couldn't, if he couldn't stand to uh, to make uh, 170, I'd love to see him at 170. Mm-hmm. Look, if I'm going to rearrange the division, I'd love to see Vitor Belfort versus Tim Kennedy at some point. I don't know mm. if it would be the match that makes sense now. Uh, Leota Machida, I'd love to see him fight Michael Bisping at some point, although Bisping versus Anderson, that's a real treat as well. I really mm-hmm. think that Yoel Romero sort of being flagged by USADA really kind of threw a spanner in the works and ruined things in a lot of ways because he's this guy who arguably is, is is ranked number one. You know, he's been removed from the rankings altogether, but you can make the case that he was number one, potentially, you know, having the title shot. And now he's sort of completely out of the picture. You can't even match him up with anyone in sort of like a title eliminator. So I don't know. If, if I was going to give the title shot to anyone else, I would probably give it to Vitor Belfort just because there is a legitimate story. And that's probably, I guess, the most tastiest matchup out of all of them. I, I, the Jacare fight in Strike Force, it was a good one. And Jacare... He hurt Rockhold, you know, a few times in that fight, and he he, he out grappled him during some parts. So I, you know, it's it's a fight that I do think would be competitive, but obviously losing to Romero like that, I don't think he's he's quite up there. It's hard for me to say he hasn't earned the title shot because people were saying he deserved it long before this, but just because of that loss, I don't think you can really give it to him. So in a funny way, I wouldn't rearrange these matchups too much. When when you look at what's readily available, I guess the Weidman fight does make sense. Yeah, and it's one of those things I think it's going to be interesting to see what Anderson's return to MMA is going to be like late February because if you see this Anderson come out who's untouchable and just destroys Mm. Michael Bisping, well, then maybe in a fight or even the next fight, you never know with the UFC, he could be fighting Rockhold next as a a potential contender if that's what he wants to do. So that's also going to be interesting as well. But just interesting to know that obviously Anderson Silva, Vitor Belfort, and now you all Romero, top guys in the division having issues with PEDs. Definitely not something the UFC is looking for. Um, let's talk about rematches because with Kane versus Vadum 2 and a potential rematch between Condit and Lawler, Holly almost having a rematch with Ronda. I mean, there were a lot of rematches in the UFC these days. I want to go to you first, Dave. Are there too many rematches in the UFC at the moment? Is it, are we just going overboard with these rematches? Yeah, you know, I don't really, I don't really think there's too many rematches. I kind of... They're kind of expected, you know, kind of given the stakes. And, you know, these guys work so hard to get to a title shot that you know, if you're somebody like Jose Aldo, where you've spent, you know, 10 years kind of keeping that together, I don't really begrudge, um, you know, options like that coming back. So, you know, Cormier and Jones are going to go again and Verdum and Vlasquez, fine. You know, it's, I think it's just the way the way it's going to go. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing is that there's been more rematches talked about than have actually happened. Like, a lot of them do make sense. I think Cain Velasquez versus Fabrizio Verdum, it really could have been avoided. And a lot of times I do find it hard to get excited for rematches just because it isn't something fresh. I'll be honest, I'm excited for this Cain Velasquez Fabrizio Verdum rematch. It's it certainly won me over, but in the initial announcement, I was like, man... They really should have given someone else a go and then revisit that fight a little bit later on. The Rockhold Weidman, you know, we just explained why it's it's not really something that you'd want to see again. I, it, it was a competitive fight, but I do feel like 
it would be nice in theory, in a perfect world, to give somebody else a go. But, you know, given, given the stakes, Holly Holm and Ronda Rousey, I'm fine with that rematch. You have to do that. Aldo and McGregor, I'm glad they didn't do that rematch immediately. And the other rematch that people have been talking about is uh, Robbie Lawler versus Carlos Condit. Again, tremendous fight, so I'm sure it will be a great fight later down that ra- you know down the road. But I just think when you have so many rematches constantly, people are looking for something fresh, and maybe that's why people are you know are getting frustrated by the fact. But I got to say, kudos to the UFC because it does seem like maybe they are listening, and I, I don't know whether that they are actually trying to do this intentionally or it's just incidental, but it does kind of seem like they're almost avoiding some of these rematches. Like you see Holly Holmes, she's not rematching uh, Ronda Rousey now. And obviously, uh, Conor McGregor, he's going up to lightweight and, and we'll see if Robbie Lola and Carlos Condit even have that rematch again. So, but all in all, yeah, I, I do. I do think the UFC should try and avoid having too many rematches. Mm, yeah, well, guys, I have a mortal a- enemy, and the enemy's called rematches. I just, I, I can't. I'm a bit like you, Casper. I'm not a big fan of rematches. I don't enjoy them. And when it's a good fight to me, it's almost like when a sequel to a movie comes out, and you don't want to watch that sequel straight away because it might ruin your initial uh, memories of that first fight. And a lot of the times, these rematches don't live up to the fight, the amazing fight that was before. So mm. I'm a big fan of. Put him, putting him out, let him have another fight, work, working their way up. And also, just from a championship perspective, it's almost like, unless it was un- unbelievably close, like, unbelievably close. I mean, the, I guess the Carlos Condit fight was very, very close. But even yeah. so, I, I, I think the champion wins, the champion won, and then you move on to the next chapter. And then if the challenger can make it back up the ladder, then, then he fights the champion. I think, especially if you have a division that has a lot of potential contenders, like welterweight, you have a lot of pretty good uh, names in there possibly that could fight for the title in the future. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm more of a fan of moving on to the next thing. And yeah, some of these rematches do frustrate me, but I'm a bit like you, Cass. I am excited with this Kane Vadum rematch. And I'm very curious as well, guys, who's going to get the next title shot out of Stipe and Overeem because that's going to say a lot as well about and where the UFC is going. I want to also add, sometimes when you do have those immediate rematches, I, I find it's disrespectful to the person who won the first fight, like especially mm. if it's a title fight. You know, if you have a grueling title fight and it's being billed as, you know, these are, these are two guys who are on the same level and somebody scrapes by and gets that decision, it's like, well, we always maybe not knew that it was going to be close, but there was always a possibility. And then if you if you do a rematch immediately, it's almost like saying, ah, well, we don't believe that should have been the right outcome. Like, take Verdum versus Velasquez. I'm one of the people who said that, yeah, if Kane was probably affected by, you know, the, the high altitude and his lack of preparation and, and his injuries. And all those things were his fault, though. And Fabrizio Verdum was the better man that night mm. and he, he prepped better. So to have them in, in an immediate rematch, like, I understand that it is, it's a curious situation. Everybody wants to know, hey, how's, you know, Kane going to do at sea level? People are billing him as sea level Kane. <laughs> and I'm, I'm curious as well, but I do think it, it is kind of disrespectful for to the champion Fabrizio Verdum as if people are saying, well, we don't know if you could really, you know, Know, we don't really know if he can really do it again the second time, so we'll do, we'll do a rematch. And I agree, like welterweight. I want to see Tyron Woodley versus Robbie Lawler. I want to see, I don't know, I want to see other options. You know, Stephen Thompson, who we just had, he's coming up in the ranks. You could do, you could do on um, Damian Maya. There's there's other options there where you don't have to do an immediate rematch. It, when Vin Diesel beat Paul Walker, Dave, in Fast and the Furious in the first movie, <laughs> it was a close win, but there was no rematches and. Um, it's one of those things that MMA is one of those crazy sports where if you watch football, basketball, any other sport, a win's a win, whether it's close or not. But in MMA, for some reason, when we have a very, very close fight, it's a do-over and it's almost like, all right, let's see how it happen- what's going to happen when it happens again. And then let's see what's going to happen when it happens again. Sometimes you have like three rematches and I really do think that sometimes you just got to leave it alone. The guy won. I agree with you, Casper. You know, a win's a win for that guy. And the other guy just has to try and make it back up. I mean, it's it's not the the guy's fault who won that it was a close fight. He won the fight. He did what he was supposed to do. So it's one of those and, interesting things. And let me just sort of further clarify as well. I'm not I'm not opposed to rematches. I'm more opposed to immediate rematches. That's what I mean. Like, of course, you're going to do Velasquez, Verdum, if, if you know, Verdum's still the champion. Of course, you're going to revisit that. Same with Daniel Cormier and John Jones. You have to do that rematch. And even Rockhold, Wyburn. It's more just the fact that it's the same fight back to back. And I think that's where he gets a little bit stale. Yeah. Any any, any thoughts on that, Dave? I, I know we sort of cut you out and give, give you a chance to jump in. Any, any last remarks on rematches before we move on? 
Uh, yeah, you know, I don't really have any more kind of, I guess, I, I agree with you guys that the immediate rematches are kind of annoying, but I sort of understand why they kind of go in that direction. Mm. You know, there's, when there's questions to be asked, you know, the C-level Kane stuff and, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, maybe, you know, the significant strike debate with Robbie Lawler and Condon and the mm. fact that Condon, you know, Condon might be like, yeah, well, I'm not going to get out of bed for anything less than Robbie Lawler. So, mm. you know, who knows? I, I kind of understand why there's immediate rematches. But I yeah, feel they, like they can they can be too many. Yeah, I feel like C level Kane is like one of those trading cards that you get like a Pokemon card. <laughs> yeah. Do you have Do you have a high altitude Kane? Because I have C level Kane, and then if you have both of them, we can trade them for a, a John Jones pre UFC title. But anyway, let's move <laughs> on to the next topic, guys. Final topic for the discussion: Conor McGregor had his first press conference with RDA for UFC 197 this past week, and as always, McGregor put on a show, coming in looking like El Chapo. And trash talking RDA as expected. Can I grab some initial thoughts on how we think RDA held himself against McGregor's first onslaught of trash talk attack? David, I want to go with you first. What did you think of RDA's uh, ability to handle that? Yeah, you know, uh, he's an interesting guy. You know, I I I live pretty close to King's MMA, so I bop in mm. there and watch them spar, and I talk to the guys. And you know, RDA man, he is he is mean. He's scary and he's he's super stoic, you know what I mean? So he doesn't get that that you know kind of like you know um he doesn't get too animated about stuff even in the gym and things like that, and, you know. But you could kind of tell that some of this stuff was probably getting getting to him a little bit, the, you know, the Brazilian comments and you know he, he was kind of laughing about it when I talked to him um cuz the trader comments came out first. Mm. And then I kind of did a little interview with him and he was talking about those comments kind of just like Largely laughing them off and things like that, you know. But was this was this before the press or afterwards? Yeah, this was before the presser. So right. there's there's been a little bit of back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's kind of fascinating because, you know, I got, I you know, you do an interview with a guy, he says X, you write X, and then people yell at you about what the fighter said. You know, very <laughs> yeah. interesting stuff. You know, so you know, in one of the, some of the comments that he made, you know, he's like, oh, you know, I'm not impressed with McGregor's, you know, the amateur belts that he got in Ireland. Yeah, you know, and I must have gotten a, you know a hundred comments from people. They they're not amateur. You should have you should have <laughs> specified that in the article. They're not amateur. Blah blah blah. And I'm like, oh, sorry. I should have vetted. You know, I should have uh, put you know cliff notes for his trash talk. You know, next yeah. time I'll do that. You know what I mean? I yeah, think most yeah. people know. I think most people f could figure out that he was trying to be a little insulting, perhaps. You know what I mean? So um, it's interesting. You know, and I I don't you know McGregor's finding new and interesting ways to kind of get under people's skin and. Going at somebody's kids like that, you know, is, is is a little bit much even for me. You know what I mean? I kind of like more fun, just kind of, you know, playful uh, trash talk, not not bringing people's kids into it, perhaps. Mm. But you know, that's just me. Who's who's you know? He said he why your kids' names Bob and Donald. They're not actually named Bob and no. Donald. No. Um, do you do you know what his kids' names are? I don't. You know, I've uh, I've met his wife, um, and she's usually there watching him spar and. Um, you know, I don't know that I've met his kids. Um, mm. I, I, they're not typically there at the gym when he's he's working out, you know. But, yeah, you know, by all accounts, they're not Bob and Donald. They're not Bob and Donald. Did, you, did, did you guys get the sort of notice that RDA did sort of turn it around a little bit on McGregor in that press conference where there was that part where he started talking about how America's got lots of immigrants and just because they've come from different countries doesn't mean they're traitors to right. their country. And you brought up some good examples. And McGregor sort of backed off a little bit when he said that because he realized he was sort of in a bad spot. Did you guys right. notice that at the press conference? Right. I, I think Connor's savvy enough to learn or right, just kind of feel out the crowd of, you know, I don't want to yeah. be on the on the wrong side of this one. Mm. You know what I mean? Given given the, you know, global economic, you know, crisis right now with immigrants. So, mm. um, you know, yeah, he might not want to be on, on this side of that. You know what I mean? So he, he can – he can uh, pivot pretty well. I think he finds little holes and ways to dig, but he's not a dummy. You know what I mean? He knows that he doesn't want to be too politically incorrect, mm. uh, you know, and, and, and uh, he's savvy enough to know that. Right. And, and that's the thing about McGregor. Like, he does come off very brash and a lot of it somewhat may seem off the cuff, but I don't... I think some of it is, but a lot of it isn't. And I think he's very right. smart in how he prepares and how he's going to attack his opponent. I think none of this whole traitor stuff was just something that he came up with, you know, yeah. randomly. Mm -hmm. I think I think he thought long and hard 
how am I going to sell this fight? And I'm, I'm impressed that that's the angle that he's going with. It's not necessarily something that I would have thought of. It, and it's it's not really that original. I mean, Chael, Chael Sonnen did the exact same thing for Anderson Silva, and it worked well. So why not revive that? I mean, that feud between Chael and Anderson is is many years ago. As far as how Anderson, as far as how Hafeyo held himself, I want to I want to sort of get your thoughts uh, sort of compared to mine, Dave, just because you know him better. But you say he's a very sort of stoic guy. It did look to me like from the very sort of early onset when McGregor was sort of, you know, pummeling him with all, all this, you know, verbal abuse. He, he sort of looked down a lot. He seemed a little bit, he seemed uncomfortable to say the least. I don't want to say, oh, he, he looked, you know, like he was mentally defeated or anything like that, but he, he seemed uncomfortable, seemed like he didn't want to be there. And we saw it with, for example, Michael Bisping and Luke Rockhold. Anytime we'd interview Rockhold, he was very confident and very comfortable. But as soon as he'd be in front of Michael Bisping, it just kind of seemed like, you know, he, he, he wasn't as confident. He wilted a little bit. Obviously, when the fight came around, it didn't make any difference. And I saw the same thing with Jose Aldo. He was very confident when he, whenever he did one-on-one interviews. But whenever they were all together and, and Connor was in, in his presence, he looked very uncomfortable. And I saw the exact same thing with Rafael Dos Anjos. And I kind of thought to myself, and maybe it is because he's so stoic and maybe because he doesn't care. But I just thought, if you know the angle that McGregor's going with... Why not maybe think of a few things? Why not maybe think of a few comebacks? You know he's going to call you a traitor and, and talk about those things. So so why not come, I don't know, maybe maybe come up with a few, I guess, comebacks. But like you mentioned, RDA, he's not really the, the type of guy to do that. Do you think that's partly why he wouldn't do it? Because he just doesn't care about the trash talk. Yeah, you know, I couldn't tell. You know, I, I talked to him, you know, I think for eight minutes or so, eight to ten minutes, um, you know, a week or two ago. You can kind of look back, see whenever that article of mine came out. Hmm. And uh, he kind of, you know, he would, he would, he would, you could definitely tell that he could, he was trying to t- kind of stick to his guns that, you know, I'm a martial artist and I don't get bothered by this and blah, blah, blah. But there was also a lot of stuff like, you know, you know, the toughest part of this fight might be not hitting him before we actually fight, hmm. you know. So that, those are things that don't, don't seem, they kind of contradict, right? He doesn't hmm. bother you. He's not going to get in my head, but it's going to be tough not to punch him before the fight. So things, Mm. you know, in this, in this chat with them, you know, you kind of go, well, how's that, how does that work exactly? So, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. You know, I think he's definitely, um, going to get a little bit, you know, upset about some of the things as per usual, you know, everyone does, you know, Mm. people are only human and, you know, his, you know, the reserve that I, he has, you know, a lot of it's probably, due to you know he, he took a knife to a gunfight you know his english is his second language and he's going up against you know conor mcgregor you know who's a black belt and trash shocking you know what i mean mm. so it's going to be tough for tough for anyone with you know speak with english is not their first language it's going to be tough to hang you know maybe uh verdum could you know but mm. yeah i don't know it's gonna be tough can I just say though that looking back at his last fight with donald cerrone i actually think he's gone he went through a lot worse with cerrone with their feud, because not only did it take ages for them to fight, but, you know, oh, the whole PED thing basically mm-hmm. brought a lot of uh, questions to light. And you had just so many fans, you know, putting out photos. Oh, RDAs and PEDs, look at his body, look how different it looks. And that was really sparked by a lot of the comments that Cerrone made. And then we saw in the fight, he, he did really, really well. So I wonder if McGregor, because I know he said some stuff about his kids in Brazil. But to me, I think just bring his physique to light and making all these questions go out there. I think to me personally, if I was an athlete, I, w- I would be sort of more pissed off about people saying that I was a drug cheat um, right. than some of the stuff that McGregor said. And he, he did pretty well. So who knows? Maybe that was a good preparation for this one. But I want to ask you guys, obviously, this isn't the Jose Aldo buildup. This isn't going to take you know, a long, long time before it happens. This will be in March. Do you think that's a bit of an advantage for RDA, the fact that he doesn't have to deal with this for as long as Jose Aldo did? I want to get your thoughts first, Dave. Yeah, I think it's a huge advantage, you know, that they are they aren't doing some sort of uh, world tour together, you know, things like that. They're just going to go out and do their own separate things. That's that's a huge a huge windfall for uh, Dos Anjos, I think, that he doesn't really have to deal. He doesn't have to do face-off after face-off after face-off every stop they go, mm. things like that. He can just kind of head home, do his thing, focus, um, you know. And he had a quick one, you know, against Cerrone. He had a minute and nine seconds, I think, right? So there's no damage on his body, really. Um, you know, he's already sparring. And, you know, I was there, what, a week or two ago, last weekend maybe, after the Cerrone fight. and. Yeah, he's back in there doing his thing, back in camp mode, 
looks to be in shape already. So, <laughs> yeah, I think it's good that it's a quick turnaround. Yeah, and, and I, I think with the Cerrone Dos Anjos fight, that fight felt like it, it was a, a long time coming. I feel like there was quite a build up for that one as well. And I wouldn't necessarily say it's an advantage for RDA, but it's kind of like the lesser of two evils. You're still going to get Conor McGregor talking trash to you. It's just better to, you know, only have to put up with it for really, what are we, like a, a month and a half away, if that. It's, it's better to put up with it for only that as opposed to, what was it, like six months or, or seven months? Not to mention the fact that Conor McGregor had his eye on Aldo for, for so much longer than before that matchup was even announced in this Rafael dos Anjos fight. Yeah, they sort of went back and forth at the Go Big press conference, but they largely avoided each other's past for a long time. So a month and a half is a lot better than, you know, six or, or nine months of having to deal with Conor McGregor's trash talk. Yeah, well, you know, it will be interesting to see how this whole thing plays out. But the other thing that McGregor mentioned that I want to quickly bring up before we wrap this uh, discussion up is he seemed to mention that he wanted to go up to welterweight and possibly uh, take Robbie Lowe on for his title. Now, when Robbie was asked, he said, I don't really get excited. And I mean, who, who expects Robbie Lowe to really care about the trash talk that McGregor says? I want to ask you guys, though, do you think McGregor legitimately wants to make a play at the welterweight title in 2016? Or is this just a bit of fun trash talking? I want to ask you first, Dave, what do you think? Is this a possibility? Oh, man, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it would ever really be a possibility. You know, it's, it's tough, you know. What is he, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, and 73-inch reach, and Lawler's 5'11", you know, I think. Mm. So so maybe, but even he's a little bit smaller, content to what, 6'1". Yeah. So you get, you, you start talking about some of the guys, talking about a Matt Brown, you know, against Connor. I mean, you start to see some some taller guys there at welterweight. So um, I don't I don't know if he could really stand to make it. I don't, I, I don't, a lot of things kind of have to fall into place for this whole, you know, ridiculousness to happen. I, mm. I don't see it happening. Maybe when McGregor's, 30 maybe he could move on up but um yeah i don't i don't really i don't see it happening i you know i'd you know i'd i'd be surprised if dos Anjos lost to mcgregor but so it's hard for me to kind of even let myself wonder what that could look like at 170 but mm. yeah it's gonna be tough sure i mean you, you mentioned obviously the the short stature and the short reach johnny johnny hendrix is a good example of someone who's mm. kind of short but obviously with johnny hendrix you get a completely different um, a completely different skill set, and I think it's easier to be a short wrestler and uh, and, and obviously negate people's reach advantage. But right. all that aside, matchups and how well he would do. If we're strictly talking about whether he legitimately wants to go to welterweight, um, I think confidence is one thing that McGregor is not short on. You can you know talk about his skills, etc., and deficits and how well he'd do against certain people. But I think he's certainly got the confidence to believe that that he would do very well. And you know when we spoke to John Kavanaugh, we're talking a while ago before the Dennis fight even then John was saying that he could definitely see McGregor making a play for the welterweight title and he said people are going to think I'm crazy but I can definitely see him him doing it I'm not sure whether he was saying that he could potentially win it but definitely make a play for us so I don't think it's going to happen by the end of 2016 I mean look we're in January right so it's 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 we've got a long road to go and you never know what's going to happen I'm I am picking Dos Anjos in this fight but you know if he does win the lightweight belt and he's already got the featherweight belt. You know, the UFC seemed a little bit reluctant to sort of let him hold on to both belts. I just, I don't know. I, I know it would help his stardom, but I just don't know if they'll allow him to hold three belts and hold up, th- you know, potentially hold up three divisions at the same time. So, I don't know. Could you imagine if he's got a welterweight or whatever lightweight bout and then somebody gets injured and then what do you do from there? You've got an... Anyway, the decisions would be in uh, in disarray. So I think he'd legitimately believe that he's going to go for it. I just don't think the UFC would let him. And it's interesting as well, guys, because I, th- I think the only way I can really see this playing out is if he wins the lightweight belt, defends his featherweight belt against Frankie Edgar, and then, you know, sort of gives it up, defends his lightweight belt a few times and then moves up to welterweight. I just can't yeah. see him doing it with the two belts and I just really can't see him being in featherweight for a really long time so maybe that's why in the back of his mind he mentioned it but that is the topics for today David St. Martin thank you so much for popping onto Submission Radio guys make sure to check out David's amazing morning reports on MMA fighting I'm sure everybody knows him and make sure to jump on and follow him on Twitter at St. MMA you know some of the best reporting in the morning that you can expect not just morning what am i talking about just of all time all week long dave always bring us the best of the best every morning thank you very much for that dave and thanks for coming on to submission radio no problem guys thank you so much for having me i appreciate it guys we'll be right back after a very short break to wrap up the show and give a couple of reviews 
Hey guys, this is Chad Money Mendez, and you're listening to Submission Radio. And there you guys have it. Another big episode of Submission Radio. Big thanks to Stephen Wonderboy, Thompson, Demetrius Johnson, and of course, Uriah Faber, Submission Radio alumni. Now, the tables are turned at the end of this episode because as many listeners know, I usually jump on and give a movie review based on Timothy Johnson's mustache. It's something that if you're a new listener, Timothy Johnson has a great mustache, so we use that as the rating system for our movies. But now, like I mentioned, the tables are turned. We mentioned last week, both of us were going to check out The Revenant together. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it. I had to go over to the Australian Open. So, Casper will break it down for us. Casper, The Revenant, give us your review. What do you give this movie? What are you thinking about it? All right. Well, we know how how descriptive and fantastic your reviews are. So, there's a lot of pressure on me. I'm going to give my best shot. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. The Revenant, 2015. Four and a half Timothy Johnson mustaches. It was good. Bam. There it is. Reviewed in a nutshell. Wow, really? Okay. Well, I, I mean, kid, no I, spoilers, right? <laughs> well, no spoilers, right? That's 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 what it's all about. No, look, I'll, I'll give it a bit more detail. Uh, Revan, I didn't know much about this movie. I knew that, obviously, Leonardo DiCaprio was, was going to be in it, and everyone was saying, look, just give the man his Oscar, and he puts on a fantastic performance. I didn't even really know what time period it was. I just saw pictures of him wearing something that looked like, I don't know, a, a bearskin rug, rug on his head. So, this movie... Uh, it's it's different. The way it's shot is interesting. It's almost like a third person. They shoot it very close up. I, I, I like this style, not really like something I've seen before. It's set in the time period. And again, no spoilers, but it's set in the time period of sort of cowboys versus Indians. I don't know what century or, or, or what time frame that is, but... It paints a very glim picture. We're not talking cowboys and Indians like, you know, Pocahontas and, and everybody gets along and all that good stuff. We're talking cowboys and Indians where you're sitting around with, with your good time buddies, having a bit of a barbecue, looking at some uh, some some animals that you caught, and then two seconds later, bam, everybody's got arrows through their faces and all your friends are dead. So it, it paints a very <laughs> glim picture. Leonardo DiCaprio is uh, is very good in it. It's it's a very raw movie. This movie holds no punches. As you can imagine, we live in a beautiful time of, you know, flat screen TVs and air conditioning. There was none of that in this time period. And this movie reminds you of that. If you're having a bad day, if you're having if you're going through something in in life, respectfully, right? Cuz I don't know what you're going through, but respectfully, I would say after watching this movie, you're probably going to go uh, you know what? Life's probably not too bad, considering what all these people went through. Um, a lot of hardship. The movie itself, it's got a very, very basic premise. Without any spoilers, it's a tale of revenge. That's the ba- this, it's it's the most basic way to put it. It's I don't think the characters are really all that deep. The storyline can be grasped by anyone. Anyone who's ever wanted to get revenge on someone will probably watch this movie and be like, "Yep, I can I can understand that." It is very long, but I liken it to like a roller coaster. There's not as many dips, and a lot of this roller coaster ride is sort of going up, preparing yourself for the dips. But when you do have those dips, I do think they're well worth it. The, the characters, though not that deep, they're they're strong, and the storytelling is very very good. Here's the thing: I'm just going to put it out there. I thought Leonardo DiCaprio was better in Wolf of Wall Street. I think he did a fantastic job. But the star of this movie is Tom Hardy. Didn't even know he was in the movie. Just goes to show how little I knew about this one going in there. When I finally saw him on screen, I barely recognized him, and uh, he, without a shadow of a doubt, stole the show for me. The transformation was just astounding. Like I said. When you see Tom Hardy on screen, you're going to be like, wow, is that really him? And just the way he plays his character, the voice that he puts on, the accent is absolutely spot on. I mean, an accent I didn't even think was possible to be done by him. If, if you're expecting previous characters like, you know, from that Tom Hardy has done, like Eames from Inception or, or, or Gay Bob from Rock and Roller, even, you know, his character in Mad Max Fury Road, prepare to be surprised. This is this is a new level of Tom Hardy. Uh, contrasting Leonardo DiCaprio, a lot of his acting in this movie wasn't even done with words. There was a lot of moments we see Leo on screen. In fact, I think a good 70% of Leo's on-screen time, he wasn't even speaking, which in that sense, you know, makes it really hard for him to act, but he did a fantastic job conveying all those emotions and, and really you know, delivering the performance and, and writing a very clear narrative and a very clear story. The whole movie, basically, even though it is long, it's all working towards a, a sort of final climax. And even though it's a very long movie, 
everything that that comes before the very end is needed. I really don't think they could have done this movie any shorter. Um, I'm just trying to think of some of the highlights. There's there's an amazing scene involving a bear. That's all I'll say, and it really is going to make you feel things. Um, the cinematography is absolutely breathtaking. There's a lot of different locations, all, all part of the same, I guess, scene and, and similar scenery, but just the way it's captured is is very different. A lot of beautiful, just simply amazing cinematography. This is definitely a movie I would recommend. Go see in the cinemas. Don't, don't download it illegally. Don't get those screeners. I wouldn't even recommend getting it on Blu-ray unless you have an amazing theater uh, room or, or some kind of crazy system. This is a movie you know, built for the cinemas. One thing for sure about this movie, it's a tale. It's an epic tale. I don't know how long it goes for, two and a half, three hours or so, but I feel like at the end, it was well worth it. Don't go and see it with your girlfriend because she's probably going to nag you about how long it goes for and how <laughs> she doesn't understand things even though you're both watching the same movie for the first time and it's only been five minutes, so how can you possibly have all the answers? God, I hate it. No, I'm just kidding. I love it. But <laughs> I'm going to give it uh, four and a half Timothy Johnson mustaches. Rotten Tomatoes gives it 82%. Forget that. It's all about the Timothy Johnson mustaches this week and every week, and I'm giving him four and a half of them. Dennis, you'll probably give it like a one, one when you see it, because you're the <laughs> toughest critic I know. But I, I feel like I feel like there's enough revenant to give like a two part review. So when, if and when, which I don't know, probably in the next week or so, you see the movie, I'll be curious to see uh, what you say about it. But go go see it. If you haven't seen it, go see it. It's the best movie I've seen all year long. If you can believe that. Wow, that's crazy. And you know, before I do a quick little review about George Costanza's bar here in Melbourne, I have to bring up the fact that <clears throat> Tom Hardy for you stole the show because yeah. Tom Hardy's actually not nominated for any awards. Crime. For the movie. Absolute and- crime. Maybe he can win like best actor in a comedy like The Martian did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which oh my this God. was not a comedy, I'll tell you that much. But yeah, yeah. That, that's crazy stuff. And you're not actually the first person to say that. So Hollywood, what are you doing? Oh, you're wow. losing your grip. But yeah, jump into this. Uh, review that I'm going to do. Basically, uh, people may know George Costanza. Jason Alexander tweeted out he has a bar in Melbourne. He doesn't actually own it, but it's dedicated to George Costanza. It's called George's Bar. And I went down there, checked it out. I have to tell you guys. And, and before just, that, there was a, a lot of hype on this. I think a lot you, of hype. I think you sort of scoped it out early, like, I don't know, maybe a few months ago. And I then, was scouting it. I was what, one of those like old baseball scouts that goes from town to town looking for George's bar. You were on the reports. cutting edge, man. You were you were on the you were <laughs> you were on the front line. You knew it before any everybody else did. And for the last few months, you just see like on Facebook and all our social media friends, everyone's tagging people, oh my god, George's bar. So this thing had a lot of heat, like mm. a major news news outlets i think i think i saw it on the news as well like the channel 7 and 9 news everyone was talking about george costanza's bar and, and how much of a big deal it is to have it here in melbourne so anyway g- go on H- how was it when you actually went there finally well you know i want to preface it by letting the listeners know if you don't know which i'm sure you do because we always sprinkle seinfeld all over our tap yeah. out rounds that me and casper are massive massive seinfeld fans and all our friends are as well it's a Crazy show, and quite frankly, if you don't like it, there's got to be something wrong with it. No, no, it's okay. It's fine. We understand. You might, you like Everybody Loves Raymond. What, you don't like Everybody <laughs> Loves Raymond either? There's something wrong with you. No, Maybe you're fine. a Frasier guy. You don't like Frasier either? <laughs> Go to hell. <laughs> you like the nanny? Listen to another show. No, I'm kidding. Um, So basically, yeah, we went down to the bar, had high expectations, and I checked it out. And unfortunately to me, it looked more like a marketing ploy to get people to this bar that was sort of just using a bit of George to get people over there, but it just didn't have the Seinfeld bar, uh, the Seinfeld sort of vibe there. You do have some pictures of George all over the walls, um, some lines like the jerk store cold and they're, ru- they're running out of you. And mm. you do have some fun drinks like the Summer of George, the Marissa Tomei, also some, you can get some uh, delicious cheese toasties as well. And there's a Twix, there's a Twix vending machine in case you're feeling hungry. So they did think that part through, but you know, there's no, there's no real Seinfeld vibe to it. There's no, I was in the pool, you know, the, it, it just didn't, there's, you know, there's no um, T-bone, there's no, there's no nothing there. So I got to say, Cass, with this review, it's one of those places, maybe you go once, but it is definitely not george's bar i think it's more of an imitation than an actual thing Mm. and uh for people going over there it is quite expensive and you don't really get the seinfeld vibe so i have to say i'm a little bit disappointed i'm going to rate this on timothy johnson's mustache scale and give it two and a half out of five because it's still hey hey somebody's still paying homage to george costanza and to me you know that deserves a half a mustache so usually it'd be two mustaches but two and a half 
for old dandy. Wow. The Timothy Johnson uh, mustache rating scale, it's expanding. No longer just exclusive for, for movie reviews. Oh, for sure. It's, it's going to be you know, everything. Uh, art galleries. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, um, cigars, fine cars, everything. Mm. We're going to start using it. And the thing is, he may not even have his mustache anymore. We have to check with him. Yeah. We're going to have to... Uh, yeah, if he doesn't have his mustache, I don't know what we'll do. The show will probably cease to, to continue uh, before we, you know, find some other kind of rating oh, scale. Sure. Well, we, we can't go like... We, we give a three out of five Timothy Johnson shaved lips or something like that. <laughs> yeah. It's just weird. It just makes things weird. And, you know, the, it's funny because there's the George Costanza bar and they're doing a Larry David bar now. Is that... I, I think you tagged me in that as well. Is that in Melbourne? I'm pretty sure in it's Melbourne in Melbourne. Melbourne as well. Yeah. It seems like the whole Seinfeld cast is going to have a bar except for Kramer. Because we all know that not many people would go to the Kramer bar due to some issues with the things that he said in a stand-up once. But it would be a Ku Klux Klan hangout. Yeah, it would be a Ku Klux Klan hangout. But, hey, I'm just waiting for the Newman to come out. He's going to have, you know, diet yogurt that's not really diet. And yeah. Pops, so that, you know what? They could, they, could do a, uh, they could do a Kramer bar as long as they don't do a Michael Richards bar, you know? Wouldn't, accept, yep. wouldn't expect Michael Richards to be at the ribbon cutting ceremony, but they could still do a Kramer <laughs> bar. If, if well, anything, you know, you have a little, I don't know, a few silly jerrys laying around. It'd be all, there'd be like a hot tub, a spa. You'd, be, you'd have like wood all over the floors, like Sweden, Jerry. Yeah, yeah, no, no, for sure. Well, my, my concept was, and I was thinking about this, there should just be a Seinfeld bar. And then yeah. you have the Kramer corner, the George corner, the Elaine corner, and the Jerry corner, and every sort of part of the bar is different. And you take all the best things about each character and you sort of put it in all the different areas. Mm. And then, you know, you can sort of experience it on a, on a higher level. But hey. And, and you and, could have knights as well. You could have Newman Knight. You could yeah, have... Um, Crazy Joe Devola Knight. Everybody dresses up as a clown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could have... Uh, um, Lomez, Lomez's place of worship night and like random side characters that with like really esoteric, uh, you know, mentions and only Seinfeld fans will understand. Yeah, no, nah, I mean, this could be a business idea that we shouldn't talk about any longer on Submission Radio because our listeners will steal it. And yeah, this is this is this is how we're going to make our millions. Well, exactly. As you saw for yourself, the money is clearly in, in, in Seinfeld themed bars, whether they're good or not. <laughs> we promise if we ever do one, it'll be uh, it'll be OK. It'll be all right. You'll be like, I probably won't go back there. Now it'll be fantastic. Um, that's it, man. That that's it for another episode. Thank you so much for for listening to us. Thank you so much for obviously David Saint Martin for coming on the show and, and, and giving us this breakdown and, and joining us on the roundtable discussion. As you mentioned before, big thank you to our guest Demetrius Johnson, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, and Uriah Faber himself. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Submission AUS. Check out the Facebook page. It's completely different. Not as many GIFs as Twitter, but a lot of informative stuff where we like to get your opinions. That is facebook.com forward slash Submission Radio AUS. And uh, don't be afraid to give us a review. If you're, on, uh, if, you, if you're cruising around, hanging out on iTunes or Stitcher, or any or SoundCloud or any of the many places that we're available on, uh, feel free to give us a review. It helps us out. And uh, until then, we'll catch you guys next week. 